Um, so I'm Meredith, everybody. Hi, Meredith. I am here to teach you about charcuterie and we have a lot to do. So I hope you're ready to make all kinds of delicious food and maybe win some of it to take home with you. I have written a book here called The Ethical Meat Handbook and um, it covers a lot of things. It covers a little bit of entry-level production for beef, pork, lamb, and poultry, but mostly it's focused on helping to empower people to do some of their own butchery, buy in larger mussels, get a better average price per pound, work with more whole foods, and there is an entire chapter on charcuterie. Um, and so, so we're here, we're here to talk about that today. Um, I have, I have a lot of plans. I thought I would start with a little bit of an intro. Um, I'm assuming if you're here, you at least know what charcuterie is. Yeah. This is not really an intro class. Um, <laughs> good. So just a basic, very succinct definition is that it's meat that's cured via salt, smoke, or dehydration. So we're going to talk about a lot of different methods for basically drawing the water out of meat, dehydrating it, which is what preserves it over time, and then um, promoting beneficial strains of bacteria that will help flavor and cure the product. So we're going to talk about fermentation, smoking, uh, we're going to talk about salt curing, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a little bit of the history of this is part of why I feel like teaching it, because the reason people came up with all this wacky stuff in the first place is because they had to preserve an entire animal once an animal was slaughtered without refrigeration, um, without some of the sophisticated technology that we have today. Um, in that way, um, it is an artisanal process through and through. It is um, slow food in its truest meaning. Um, and that's something that I feel very passionate about. Um, I also believe that as we try to move towards a more ethical way of eating meat, we need to look at smaller portions. We need to look at um, you know, more intense shots of protein, and charcuterie is a perfect way of doing that, rather than a big hunky ribeye on your plate if you can just get a little amuse-bouche from you know, a small bite. And that's something that Patrick helped me understand because he's not really a huge meat eater, but um, when I gave him the charcuterie, he said, wow, this really lights me up, like I can get into this because I'm not really used to eating and chewing on meat because I've been a vegetarian or whatever, but this is, this is working for me, and it made me see the role not only that charcuterie plays in using the entire animal, but also in changing people's minds about what meals should look like and how food should taste. Um, so that's a little bit of my philosophy um, behind why we need to learn this. If, if, regardless of whether or not you are going to butcher your own animal, if you are, I think without question, some level of charcuterie experience and, and and being comfortable with it is needed in order to make the best use of the entire carcass. But even if people aren't going to be, you know, cutting their own meat or, you know, endeavoring into that much butchery, there are small things that you can take away and really enjoy food so much more if you know how to make your own bacon, for example. Um, making sausages is one of my most favorite things in the world because you can create endless flavor profiles as long as you have the ratios right. So we'll talk about that today and my hope is that when you leave, you will feel comfortable developing your own sausage recipes at home. You'll have a comfortable grip of the math so that you can mix and match flavors as you wish and it'll be a breeze. Um, that you'll be comfortable with emulsifications, which is basically like a sausage with um, a higher ratio of fat and liquid. So when we think about an emulsification, we think about a really smooth textured item like a hot dog or a bologna, where you can't tell the difference on your tongue between the meat, the fat, and the liquid. Um, and then you will hopefully be more comfortable using organ meats, which is a really nutritious and um, thrifty way to eat meat. Um, and hopefully you will, if you will either leave today convincing yourself that you never, ever, ever want to ferment meat because you're too scared, or that you will feel comfortable giving it a try. Um, and I say that just because that's the feedback I've gotten from people who've taken classes before. Like, well, I think you convinced me that I don't want to make salami, but I feel okay making bacon and I feel okay making sausage. So hopefully you'll get a better feel for that kind of stuff. The way I think about charcuterie is sort of like in a graduated way. So if you start here with your fresh sausage, and then you go all the way here over to this side of the spectrum to your fermented sausage or dry cured salami, then everything in between, you know, you can kind of learn it in that order and your, your knowledge will sort of gain. So that's kind of how we're going to move through the day. Um, but before we do that, I thought I would just cover some of the equipment that we're going to be using. Oh, and before I do that, we're going to put this head to boil because I want to be picking head cheese by the time, at least by like halfway through the class. 
So we have here a um, pig's head. This pig, by the way, is from Wild Turkey Farms in China Grove, North Carolina. It's completely pasture raised. Um, I think, I believe it's Tamworth, or at least has some Tamworth lineage in it, which is a heritage breed. Um, I have taken the jowls off of this pig, so it doesn't, that's why the head looks a little bit funny. Um, and we'll look at the jowls in a little bit. I have thrown in, in addition, this tongue and extra skin just to increase the gelatin in the broth so that we have a richer aspect when we go to pack the head cheese into the pan. And since this is going to have to boil for a few hours, I thought we would just go ahead and get it started. Pat, would you mind just getting this full, basically, with cold water? Nice little segue there. Um, and that's a, head cheese is technically a terrine, which is one of the easiest terrines to make. Terrine being um, larger particles of food suspended in an aspic or a gelatin-rich liquid. Um, and there's lots of ways to do that, but head cheese is one of the easiest practice ways to do that because because the head is so much bone and eyeball and skin and brain and tongue, then all those things, skin and tongue and organ, those are the things that supply collagen and gelatin to a liquid. So if you want, you know, if you want to make gelatin, you want bones and skin in your broth. If you want a not so goopy broth, you want more meat, right? So um, because the head has all those things already in it, it produces its own aspect as you go. So then when we get ready to pick all the meat off, it'll just nicely create a terrine without a lot of extra effort. Um, so it's a good practice run. It produces its own what? It produces its own aspic, basically. So it's, pretend I was making a vegetarian terrine, which I've done before. It's like a bunch of vegetables, but then I would have to create a separate aspic with like agar or gelatin that I would then pour over the item that would then solidify and hold everything together. So that's just kind of the difference um, between head cheese and a lot of the more involved terrines. Um, so equipment, the stuff that we'll be working with today. Um, we're not going to do a lot of cutting today. I would love to like keep you here for a week and we would do like whole animal butchery and we would like, you know, boil a head for whatever, four hours together and we would, Laura Ingalls Wilder style, smoke some bacon together, but you would probably hate me by then and we don't have enough time. So. Um, I'm just going to go quickly over some of this stuff and as we talk about what we're doing, we'll talk about where that cut came from and how you might isolate it if you are interested in butchery. This is a boning knife. This is the most um, essential butchery knife that you can own. This is an F. Dick boning knife and I really like it. I've been using Portioner Victorinox for a really long time and I like this one better. Um, uh, so this is a stamped knife. It's a flexible blade. You can see that. It's one of my favorites for boning. Um, this cost me about $25, no big deal. Since I go through boning knives pretty often, I don't like to spend a whole lot of money on them, but you may disagree, it's totally fine. Um, if you're gonna have a knife, you need to have a steel. This is a stainless steel honing steel. The difference between this and sharpening your knife, this is composed of lots of little teeth, even though you can't see them. And as you use your knife, those teeth get bent out of shape. So when you hone the knife, you're bending all those little teeth back into alignment Whereas when you're sharpening, you're actually taking metal off of the blade. So that's why you don't want to be sharpening every time you use it. But every single time you use a knife, kitchen knife, whatever, you need to be honing it. Um, and there's a knife skills class that we did that covers a lot of that stuff um, that should be online soon. So we'll, we'll use that a little bit. Um, we'll use some butcher twine, cotton twine, basic. Um, you can put it in the oven. You can put it in the smoker. You can ferment it, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, hooks, which I don't have to show you, but whenever we're hanging hams or bacon, there are several different S hooks or ham hooks or gambrels, which is like basically a rod with a bunch of hooks on it that you can use um, for hanging different pieces of meat. Um, a good work table is really nice. If you do a day like this where you make a lot of stuff, you want to not be bending over the entire time. So this is a nice working height. Um, if you want to cure things in vacuum seal, you can use like a food saver or other vacuum sealer. We don't have one today to show you, and you don't need it. It's not essential, but I just thought I would throw it in there. Meat grinder. We have a couple different ones that we're going to be using. Um, how many people here own a meat grinder? How many people here own a meat grinder and have used it a lot? OK, great. So like a quarter of us. Awesome. So we'll talk about how it works. Um, I have one that attaches, oh, we got the camo model here. Um, <laughs> um, so I have one that attaches to a commercial size KitchenAid mixer, 
which is what I bought when I committed to writing the book for people who were doing this on a home scale, because I thought it would be reasonable for people who maybe already had a mixer in their kitchen. Okay, meat grinder. We'll talk about how it goes together. We'll also be using sausage stuffers. This is a vertical stuffer. Um, I have two models, and we'll go over how that works. Hopefully, I brought the stuffing horns for both of these. Um, so, let's see what else. Oh, a grinder for grinding spices. I'm just using a coffee grinder. This is really important. I'm super anal about having whole spices when I do this kind of stuff. It's way better. Um, Cheesecloth is helpful for making herb sachets or for hanging meats. Um, a food processor or an immersion blender can come in handy when you're making pâtés or really fine emulsifications. Um, casings. There are natural hog casings and the natural beef middles. We use the beef middles for salami and hog casings for sausage and we'll talk about a few of the other options as we go. Um, you want a digital scale that weighs ounces and grams. This cost me like 40 bucks online somewhere. I get a lot of my stuff from sausagemaker.com or butcher-packer.com. Those are good sites to go for getting this kind of stuff. Um, loaf pans or tureen molds. They're for making pâtés and tureens. Um, pH meter, which is optional. We'll talk about it later. Um, cultures and curing salts. We'll talk about later. Um, so, let's go. Um, all right. Like I said, I feel like the best way to start is by making fresh sausage. So what I'm going to do is talk about, you have in front of you a handout that looks like this. And what this is is an overview of all the different sort of, like I've categorized the different approaches. Fresh sausage, emulsified meats, whole muscle cures, and then fermented sausages. Those are the four main categories. So my position is that if you know how to make a fresh sausage and then you kind of learn the other ratios, then you can pretty much do anything. So we're going to start by, by making said fresh sausage. This is also for the head cheese right here. Is it long enough? Uh, yeah. It's, it plugs in, it'll plug in behind the coffee pot. Okay. And then come over here so that everybody can see the meat while it's grinding. So I'm going to give you a sausage recipe. Ready? Uh, two and a half pounds of pork lean meat, a pound of pork fat, back fat, an ounce of kosher salt, 0.7 ounces of fresh ground black pepper, 0.2 ounces of dried thyme, a couple tablespoons of garlic, maybe a little bit more for giggles, and then three quarter cup of white wine. This is a super simple garlic thyme sausage, and it's a great base recipe. So if you start there with those, that ratio of lean to fat and salt, you can add pretty much whatever you want. And if we have enough time, we're going to do a contest. If anybody feels like it right now on your table and you want to slice up livers and hearts, I would really love that. I can get you a cutting board. You can use this one. I think the recipe for our pate calls for two pounds of, of stuff. So we might not need all this. When you're making a fresh sausage, you want a 70% to 30% ratio of lean to fat. So that is what that recipe that I gave you, if you do the math, you'll find that you've got 30% fat and 70% lean. I've weighed them out separately here. Got to get the grinder parts, sorry. You want everything to be as cold as possible, not only because meat harbors bacteria, but also it keeps the fat from reaching melting point. If the fat reaches melting point, it'll smear and you'll get a bad texture and it'll be all goopy and gross. So let's just go over the grinder really fast. Oh, what you want, Lauren? Is pieces, or is it stinking? No, it's cold. Good, yeah. <laughs> the colder you work liver, the more you will, yeah, not, <laughs> want to gag. Um, okay, so what you want is like maybe strips, like, I mean, you see the size of this, yeah. so. Okay. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've trimmed this into like roughly three inch long strips because that's the shape of my grinder. So depending on what your grinder looks like, you may choose to do it differently. This is the shaft. This is the worm. The worm goes in the shaft. The knife 
has two sides. It has a beveled side and it has a flat side. The flat side goes out. You're laughing like you've made that mistake before. Yeah, lots of people make that mistake. If you, if you start grinding your sausage and it's coming out like somebody has been beating it with a hammer, it's because you have your knife turned the wrong way. So it's flat side out, then your plate goes on. There's usually a little pin in there. So you line up the little notch with the little pin. Sometimes it's good to lube, haha, the worm, um, because it gets a little funny. And y'all, somebody can put the other one together pretty soon. What I don't want to do is have to turn around grinders every five seconds to make different stuff. So we're going to hopefully tag team in a bit. So I put my plate on top of the knife. This is the coarse plate. Um, most grinders come with a coarse and a fine. We're going to use both of them today. Normally I would put all these moving parts in the freezer before I started. My machine is hefty enough that I can work all the meat totally stone frozen. If you have a hand grinder, good luck with that. It's probably not going to work. If you have a hand grinder, God bless you anyway, because silver skin and all that stuff is going to get caught, and you're going to get bound up, and it's just no fun. So I recommend an electric grinder, unless you're like anti-electricity, which I understand you are. This just screws right in here. Sometimes it's helpful to tighten it all up with the rag so you don't end up with a turning shaft as you grind frozen food. The freezer's all the way downstairs, so today I'm not working with frozen product. We're going to try to grind that liver before it thaws out. That'll be our goal. If it starts to smell like somebody melted aluminum in here, then you'll know why. Um, so, let's see, we need a bowl. Now, some people mix their spices in after they grind, but I always mix before because I think the grinding process helps distribute the seasonings really well. Nobody likes a bite of sausage where there's a pocket of seasonings that haven't been mixed in well enough. If you're a super rock star, you'll mix all the seasonings into this, and then you'll stick it in your fridge overnight and let it sit there for a while. And then you'll put it in the freezer on a sheet pan and let it flash freeze for like an hour before you make the sausage, or maybe 30 minutes. And that's going to be the best bet. So this is my thyme, pepper, salt, garlic, white wine that I gave you the recipe for. And I'm just going to stick it in here, and I'm going to massage it around. Get it all mixed together. Hopefully this works. Yeah, great. Um, so this is, like I said, commercial KitchenAid mixer. This thing will run you like 300 bucks. The Chef's Choice attachment I really like because all the parts are stainless steel. There are some attachments with plastic or nylon parts and they just wear faster. They warm faster, so if you're making larger batches, you get smearing more quickly. Um, so I put the little food pan on top of it. I'm going to run this thing up between four and six, and it's going to get loud. Welcome to come up here if you want, if you can't see. If we have time, then you all will get to do this, hopefully. A couple times. <laughs> This, this particular lean meat came from the shoulder. So I'm not, when I'm trimming, hold on.
don't know. That's a good question. You should, you could look it up. It may be that Chef's Choice makes a different model for the regular size. Yeah. What's that? Um, why don't you put all the moving parts in the fridge real fast? Thanks. All right. See how easy that was? Ideally, this would be nice and chunky and frozen, but it's a little bit soft. And then what I usually do is I take half of that. What you want is all those seasonings to bind really well, and you want a good eating experience when the person eats it. How many people have had a sausage that was all pulverized on the inside of the casing? Or it was like too chunky or whatever. So this is the way of getting like a really good bind, number one, and getting really good texture. Works every time. You take half of this, you don't have to change your plate at all, just stick it back through it. And I'll try to pull these aside so you can look at the difference that you get in grind. You see the difference? Good texture. So we mix all this together. So, so why, did, why did you only do half? Like, we're not done with the four, I think we're going to You can do that too. I like to have um, just varied texture. Mm -hmm. I think that's. So, my. Okay, my thing's about sausage. I'm a little bit anal about it. Um, we're gonna taste. We're gonna taste it. Always taste at this stage because then if you mess it up, you can still fix it. But once you get it inside of a pig intestine, you're kind of stuck with it. Um, so we're gonna taste a lot of it. Cause there's a lot of us. Um, so my thing about sausage is that it's not worth making if it's too salty. There's not enough liquid and it has a bad texture. So I think if you're making a fresh sausage, you need a 1.75% salt ratio. No higher, no lower. That's the perfect ratio for fresh sausage. Um, if you're using salty ingredients, like a salty liquid, then you might want to cut it a little bit. But in general, I think that 1.75 is pretty spot on. I think having half finer ground than the other half creates a really good texture and a really good bind. And I think that the liquid, there's no master recipe for the liquid ratio. It's got to vary depending on how many dry spices you've got in the sausage along with it because they're all going to soak up a bunch of liquid, so it's generally 10 to 14 percent. Um, there's like in the book, you'll see, for example, if you look at it, there's a like kind of like a curry worst, but it's lamb, so it's got all kinds of curry spices, all kinds of dry spices in it. And I think the liquid in that recipe is close to 14 percent, 15 percent, you know. Whereas in something like this, it's going to be on the lower end, maybe more like 10 percent, because there's not that much going on. All right. We work it cold, okay, to keep the fat from smearing, to keep the texture really nice and built, but also because ground meat carries a higher, it has more surface area. So in the time that I have this product out of the refrigerator, bacteria within 20 minutes can start to multiply. So the more surface area the meat particles have, the higher chance I have of contaminating it. So you really want to make sure it's as cold as possible. So we're just gonna let this test really fast while I try to find my casings. So these are natural casings. They come from the intestines of pigs. These come from beef. 
We're going to use these today for our sausage. These are hog intestines. I like to order them packed in salt instead of already hydrated. Um, I find that stuffing kind of depends on the humidity sometimes in the room. And if I've got casings that are already hydrated, I've done a lot of like, like people call me out to consult if they do like a hog killing and they want to make a bunch of sausage that day, they'll have me out and we'll like bust out a bunch of charcuterie. And a lot of times if we're working outside in the cold and we have hydrated casings, then just start busting left and right, you know. So if you can hydrate your own, I find that it helps. So what it is, it'll come packed in salt. And this seems really gross, but I really enjoy it, just so you know. Some people, you know, you might really enjoy it too. Um, it seems really nasty. It's like an intestine, but this, it's really kind of nice. Um, so they come in um, units called Hanks, which I think is 100 yards. And it's not that expensive. So you can buy them and you can keep them in your refrigerator. And as long as they're packed in salt, then they're pretty, they stay pretty good for a long time. I've had these for about a year and I'm still using them. They're fine. In the fridge. Okay. I know some people who say, well, I buy my, ho my hog casings frozen, but I was always taught never to freeze your casings because as those water, any water in them freezes and the crystals will pierce little holes in them and they'll be more susceptible to busting. Pat, would you like to just watch that sausage for me to make sure that it doesn't burn? So what I've got here. When you say salt, can you, can you see the bag? Is it, is it just uh, This is a Ziploc bag. Gotcha. Um, these might still be in their original bag. No, they're not. Really, if you say you rinsed more casings than you thought you needed, you could just literally dump them in a bowl, dump kosher salt on top of them, mix them all around until they're well coated in salt, and put them back in a bag and put them in the fridge. Um, I have an entire drawer in my fridge that's dedicated to casings. <laughs> so um, this is how I measure them. This is a yard. If anyone's mother didn't teach them that in sewing, three feet. So we're gonna need, for the sausage recipe that we made, we're gonna need uh, maybe 10 feet. What's that? I mean, it's, it's, it's just, just like weaving. Everything comes in hangs, and you measure. Uh-huh, yeah. A lot of people think this is gross, but it's, it's like just weaving. whatever, yeah. Once you start, so then, of course, what you need to do is rinse all the salt off of them when you're ready to use them. Um, so cold water when it works is really good, okay. They like to slip down the drain on you a little bit, so you gotta be careful. Um, but I'm just tossing them around until I don't feel any salt on the outsides anymore. And then what I'm gonna do is find an end, and I'm gonna let the water run through it. That way I can check for any air bubbles. Um, I can make sure the inside is really, really rinsed. Um, you know, the consequence of not doing that well may be that your sausage tastes ridiculously salty and you're like, what? I put the right amount of salt in it, what happened? So, where's the end? A good way to do this if you have like a utility or sink or something and you're rinsing a lot is to just fit the end of the casing around the faucet. You can also just get a pocket of water in it and just pull it through. And I like to do that twice. And then it's good to have a little bowl, which I don't have. Yes, please. Um, because you want to keep your casings as moist as possible while you're stuffing. If there are enemies of sausage stuffing, it is air. It's air. It's air in general. Drying out casings, air bubbles inside. Those are the two things you don't want. Yeah, the little one works. Later when we make salami, because we're gonna have so much time today, we'll use these beef middles, which are like three or four inches in diameter, so you'll see the difference there. They're a lot thicker, they're not edible, so you wanna cut them off, whereas the natural hog casing is edible. So what I'm gonna do is just let these kind of sit around in the water. It's gonna be sort of tepid, it doesn't have to be ice cold, while I'm prepping my stuffer. Are these done, you think? Yep. Probably done. Okay. We don't want to stuff it if it doesn't taste good. Needs a little more time. Okay. So, this is a vertical stuffer, like I said earlier. I like this because you get all your meat in this little canister, and then it has a press with an airlock in it that will press all the sausage out into the casing. 
I do have an attachment for this because I wanted to try it out, but it was a total waste of money. It's the same model as this basically, and the stuffer comes off the end, but it forces you to stuff the product in as you're stuffing it, which basically just introduces air over and over again into the sausage as you're going. So I don't recommend it. I recommend a vertical stuffer. This costs about $100. That Vivo down there is my favorite, um, and it costs $200. The reason I like it better is because all the parts are stainless steel and it's heavier. So when you're stuffing by yourself, you can turn it without the stupid thing moving, which this one will do. Um, but I may get somebody up here to help and if you want um, to do this one. Do you feel like washing? So this guy usually comes with three different horns. This would be your smallest one. This is for like your breakfast sausage, tiny little links that are usually stuffed into sheep intestines. So same as what we just rinsed, but from a sheep instead of a cow. Um, and it cranks like this. These are nylon gears and they've broken on me one time. The good thing about it is that I called the company and they took it back and they sent me a new one. So they were very easy to work with. So if you, you know, if you're on a budget and you get one of these, I, it's been a really good stuffer. This is also the one I take on the road with me. It's been to Canada, it's been to Texas, it's been to Kansas, it's been up on stages, and it still works. So, you know. Yeah. So here's the little press I was telling you about. It's got a gasket on it. It's got this little airlock. Um, <clears throat> canister is just an empty stainless steel container. This holds five pounds. So... Somebody, somebody volunteer to try the sausage and be the one who tells us if it's good or not. All right, Greg, go get yourself a bite. Yeah, it's a good one. Right out of the pan. I like this guy. Is it good? Yeah, real good. I taste the vegetables in it. Like. <laughs> right on. Good. I was worried for a second about what you were going to say. Okay. All right. So what I did was just thread this horn through here. Yeah. Will you turn the, um, let's see. We need a sheet pan, sheet pan. It's OMCAN, O-M-C-A-N. So the way this works is you have to have the press all the way up in order to put the canister back in because it fits under these two little guys at the bottom. So we've got the press up. We're gonna fit in under there once we get all the meat stuffed inside. Feel like putting that in there? Pardon? Feel like either serving this up and sure. passing it around? All right. Hardly any fat in the pan, though. So hopefully it'll be enough for everybody to taste. Be a uh, be nice to your neighbor there. Save some. So I like to keep a sheet pan under this just to catch the coil as it comes out. You can do it right on the counter, but it kind of slips off and then it's a little bit messy. Um, all right, so I've got it in there. The middle size horn is what you'll use for standard sausages. I lost the bigger one on the road somewhere. You want to crank it down until the meat is just barely coming out of the horn. If I went ahead and put my casing on there right now and started stuffing, I would just push a bunch of air into the very last link. So, And what I really like to do, and I'm super on top of it, which I am today, sort of, is put a little oil on the horn so that it's easy to get the casings on. size, um, relative thickness, um, if you're going to smoke them, some, smoke the sausages sometimes, you'll use different ones. Um, and there's just, there's a lot of different ones to choose from, especially if you get into the synthetic casing world. But in general, I think you can put every sausage in either a sheep casing or a hog casing, and then you can put any salami in either a beef bung or beef middles, and you've you got four kinds of casings that you're working with. No big deal, you know? Um, where's the end? Well, not necessarily. I mean, 
You could probably get this one on the bigger horn, but it's more made for like the beef middles and the bigger diameter. Um, I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty hardy. Like you can, you can mess with them a lot and they won't rip. That is at least these, some of the prehydrated. So what I'm doing is just running it on there like pantyhose. Just get it all. How what? About 10 feet. And I may have mis misestimated a bit, but we'll, we'll see. Oh, we got a knot in it somehow. And this, you know, this is made out to be a really nasty and really weird process, but it isn't, you know? This is just meat and salt and spices, and this is just an intestine. You have them, you know? So this is coming out. I'm tying a regular knot in the end. I might double it over if I'm a rock star. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just crank the handle, and I'm just going to let it let it come out. This is not that hard. It does take practice. I usually, I'm not so much holding this as I am holding the sausage. And I set my hand kind of at the diameter that I want the sausage to be. And I just let that link fill up my hand. And when it is, I can let it pass through. If I find that it's not stuffing enough, I can shove it backward and keep going. I mean, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more intuitive than it is anything else. If I get air bubbles along the way that I'm nervous about, I can use my knife to prick them out, or I can just let them sort of work, their, work themselves out. Before I link it, I may choose to work the air bubbles out at that time instead. So when you added vegetables before grinding, how do you determine how many vegetables? There were some vegetables you added, right? Uh, I added some thyme, I added some herb. It was just herbs. The vegetables I added were to the head cheese pot, and that may have been a little confusing, but we'll go over that when we talk about the head cheese in a couple of minutes. No, I, care, I measure carefully. I use my gram scale. Um, you know, I, you know, maybe with like the thyme or the garlic, I would just wing it a little bit, but with the salt and the liquid and the meat and the fat, you want weights, you know? How is it? Pretty good? This recipe with the white wine percentage of liquid there, do you have to have 10 to 14 percent of some type of liquid? Mm -hmm. It can be beer, it can be water, it can be liquor, it can be broth, it can be cream. But really, I mean, better, better not water, right? Like there's so many different flavorful liquids that we can do. Actually, Pat, there is a, um, a pan on the stove that has, so I just busted it, which will happen. And all I'm doing now is backing sausage out of where I busted it so that I can tie it off and then, and then start over. Pan? Nope, there's, there's a pan with some stuff for broth in it. It's like bones and it's already full of water. Like yeah, I was just going to make some stock really fast. So you want me to turn it on? Turn it on. <clears throat> you want to leave enough um, casing at the end to tie it off? Oh, my bad. I put two and a half um, tablespoons. You gave that to us. I'm sorry. Did I say two or two and a half? You said two. Okay, well, I like garlic, so two and a half, maybe two if you're, if you're not sure. They make special tools called sausage prickers that you can get for pricking out air bubbles. I've been known to use a safety pin or a paper clip or a knife or a pair of scissors. Well, because if you're linking it, then it's going to explode if it has a big air bubble in it. When you cook it, it can explode. And if you're fermenting it, you want no air inside of it, you know, um, because that's just, you know, a place where you can get funny little mold growths or something like that. So to link it, 
and you'll bust it doing this too, it's no big deal, you just tie it off and start over. You wanna go about six inches from the end and your thumb and your index finger, you make a little indention and then you just twist it. Three or four times in one direction. That's right. And then you go, I think twisting balloons is harder. <laughs> um, you do another indention and you wanna twist the other direction so that if you were to hang these up to dry or to smoke, they wouldn't all just come unraveled because they were linked in the same direction. So I'm just gonna go along eyeballing how big I want my links to be. And I stuffed it a little bit loose, you might have seen as it was coming out, because as I'm linking it, all that meat's gonna shove in to the inside of the sausage and it's gonna fatten up as I go. Meredith, have you ever hung sausage to dry? Mm hmm Usually in a cooling space, never like out, outside. Right. What about you? My father used to do that um, when he was living. He and my mom used to make their own sausage and they had rafters. Nice that they hung it over. And I mean, the, when it got, with all the fat that dripped down and off, when you got ready to cook that sausage, it was wonderful. But it oh, did they smoke it? No, they didn't smoke okay. it. They, they just, just dried it. They just dried it. Yep. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. I wouldn't do it in my barn rafters today. I wouldn't do a sausage out of a cabinet. We'll talk about how to build a cabinet later. I do whole muscle cures in my kitchen. It's worked out fine for me but ground meat I get a little nervous about. So here we have our bing bing garlic thyme sausage. Where do you order your pieces from? These came from butcherpacker.com. It's butcher-packer. Um, but you can get them from, um, you know, if you just Google natural hog casings, you'll find a few different companies. Sausagemaker.com is another good company. Um, I'm not gonna keep stuff in this because I do wanna move on. But uh, what we wanna do next is, is that grinder clean? Or Joe, did you have your parts in the, in the fridge? Yeah. All right, let's grind the liver and the heart through. The yes, let's put all the moving parts in the fridge as well as that pan that the food goes in before. So we'll just, later when, at the end of the day, if you're not tired, too tired, we're gonna like lay a bunch of boards out with everything that we've made and we're gonna eat. So we'll save this for um, later. This is a really classy way to get meat out of the stuffing horn. Okay. So we're gonna talk about, you know, pate next, which is just a sausage with different ratios in it. It's considered, a pate is essentially a sausage. It's emulsified though. It's never served in sausage form. It's in a loaf pan, but a hot dog is an emulsified sausage. Same principle, mortadella, same principle. So we'll move on to that unless there are other questions about fresh sausages. Yes. Um, th this woman was talking about her parents hanging them up. Now, what would you, would you cook these immediately? Would you put them in the refrigerator and wait a week? Would you? Depends on what I'm doing with them. If I need to feed my hungry children, I could cook them immediately. Okay. If I was going to smoke them, then I would want to let them sit in the refrigerator. Maybe not necessarily hanging. Hanging would be best, but they could be coiled on a plate and they could sit overnight. Because what happens is they become really nice and dry during that process. Any, the drier something is, the better it picks up smoke. It also forms a little layer of proteins on the outside of the casing called a pellicle. And what that does is seal it a little bit better and it also helps the smoke adhere. Um, and so any drying that you do is going to encourage that pellicle to form. Um, so we'll put these in the fridge now. And Michelle, when she gets here. What's that? Let's do the fine plate. Yeah. Um, so as your knowledge graduates, you might move on to emulsified sausages. Basic same principles, the same you know, method of grinding. Everything needs to be really cold. The only difference is the ratios. So a 5-4-3 is the ratio for an emulsified sausage. And I put the percentages, I think, on this, yes, on the PowerPoint that's printed out because 5-4-3 ratio is by weight, right? So sometimes that can be a little bit confusing, but if you have the percentages right there, they're a little bit odd. It's like 42% lean, 33% fat, 25% liquid. So you'll see it's a lower amount of lean product, relatively the same amount of fat, but a much higher liquid ratio. 
And so what that's, an emulsification of any kind, whether we're talking about a vinaigrette, a mayonnaise, or a hot dog, what that is, it's the, um, it's the dispersion of one thing into another thing that are not normally soluble together. So it's like forced um, dissolution of, you know, essentially like, like a fat into water, for example, is a great, is a great example of an emulsion. Um, so we have this, uh, li there's, there's pork liver here and there's pork heart. And my big argument for pâtés is it's the, pretty much the only way that we should be eating organ meat. If you, if you don't like it, if you like to stir, stir fry up some livers, then go for it. But in my experience, most Americans do not enjoy organ meats. And yeah, you can give them to your dog, but putting them in a pâté and flavoring them really nicely with a good panade, which we'll talk about, then you can create a million different flavor profiles. They won't taste like organs anymore. And you can mix it with mayonnaise, have a pâté mayonnaise, have really beautiful condiments, make sandwiches. It's easy to make ahead of a party, blah, 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 blah. There's lots of good things about pâtés. Um, in general, addition, in addition to the different ratios for fat to meat to liquid, there's higher percent salt and seasonings in any emulsified meat because they're usually meats that are served cold. And it is harder for you to discern flavors on your palate when you're eating something cold than when you're eating something warm. So you'll see in the PowerPoint up to 2% salt in an emulsified product and more aggressive seasonings. Um, and in general, it's pretty much the same thing. Joe's going to grind this, right Joe? Yes. You might want to, uh, oh, will that reach to here? That'll reach to here, right? So the only difference here is that we have a different grinder, but it's set up exactly the same as the other one. The worm, the shaft, the plate, the knife, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to plug in. He's grinding through the fine plate because in general, emulsifications are much finer. You may, as you, you know, what we may do as we grind this, we may decide later, or maybe not, you may decide when you have enough time that you want to further emulsify it. So once it's through the plate, you could either send it through again, or you could put it in a bowl with like a stick blender, or you could put it in a food processor and you could whir it a little bit more. You can break an emulsification just like you can break a custard. So you have to be careful especially as you work it and the product starts to heat up. You really need to be careful. Sometimes when I grind an emulsification, I grind into a bowl that I've had in the freezer for a little while just to keep it really, really cold. And it's going to feel funny and kind of chunky. Oh, we need to put some stuff on that before you... What do you need? I need a bowl to grind it into, too. Okay. <laughs> it's not a side catch. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'm not grinding that right there. So. So what I have in here, if you look at the pate recipe, this is a really, really basic liver pate. So you can add, and I have some that I made with chicken livers and duck livers and duck hearts and duck kidneys before I came. We're, we'll want this to chill for a while, so we won't be able to eat the one that we made necessarily. So I made some other ones. And when you taste it this afternoon, then you'll be able to see like, okay, wow, like I could really do a lot with this. I could add a lot of different stuff. I could sweeten it. I could add more liquor. So what I have here is onion grated, there's a uh, garlic, grated, there's salt, uh, quatre apice, which is a French blend of spices. There's a recipe for it in my book, um, but it's like white pepper, clove, nutmeg, allspice, um, which is a really, really traditional way of seasoning pâtés and emulsified meats. Um, and then there's black pepper. So Joe's going to put this on the liver and the heart before he grinds it. And then we're going to start a fire right here. What's up? Just pour it on and mix it up? Yep, just mix it on up. Do I need to keep the liver and heart separate? Or can I just no, no, mix we can combine together? it all together. The head cheese is boiling, y'all. Hopefully it'll be done in time. My favorite thing you've ever said. Head cheese is boiling, y'all? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, all right, so let's see. Anything else that we need to talk about before? Oh, I prepped some pans. This is a good thing to do before you start grinding. I like to make little tiny pâtés, but you can make a big one if you want. So I have these little three cup metal molds. And um, the ones I made earlier, I was at home. I'm about to move tomorrow. So I'm like packing up my whole house and I'm like, oh, I need my terrine pans. I need my sodium nitrate. Like I was keeping out the weirdest things. I need my pig casing set aside. So I was like trying to set stuff aside and I didn't set aside plastic wrap. So I went to make my pâtés and I ended up just having to dump the batter into the pan. So they're a little ugly. 
Because what the plastic does is kind of keep it packed in while it's baking, and then it helps you turn it out really easily afterwards. Um, so that's what I've done here. I just oiled the pan, and then I put plastic wrap down inside of it. It does. And that's another reason why you may choose not to use it. Some people use foil, but there are similar concerns about foil and aluminum, you know, so it's up to you. These pans are stainless steel. Doing it without it is perfectly okay. It'll just be uglier. No big deal. So I have three of these, which is appropriate for this recipe. That's like nine cups of batter. So just, you know, if you want to make it in a bigger pan, just keep that in mind. You might need two. fine, exquisite pâtés, what they will do in addition to further emulsifying this, they may um, push it through a chinois, if you've ever seen one of those. It's like one of my favorite pieces of kitchen equipment. It's just like, it's like a sieve, but it's flat. And you put the food on the top and then you just like, you kind of comb it through and it really presses it around. So you want to wash your hands, Joe? Um, so here we have, I mean, this is not, this is like a, semi-fine pate. We're not going to mess with it much more than this because I want to talk about smoking. One of the things you may choose to do if you are going to further emulsify it is throw some ice in there. That's what a lot of like the big plants do when they're making hot dogs or like really big style emulsifications is they'll run ice through with it to keep the product cold, keep it cold so the emulsification doesn't, emulsification doesn't break. What I've made here is a panade. A panade is a, a liquid, a flavoring liquid that's thickened with flour or cornmeal. It's a French term. Um, this one is two eggs, flour, heavy cream, and bourbon. Um, it's really just basic and yummy. And I'm just stirring it up now because it got a little funky in the fridge. So it, it's really, what the panade does is help hold it together and help flavor it. So I'm just gonna dump the panade right in with it. I think my oven's on. And then I'm just going to stir it up. All right. So now all I'm going to do is pour, try to evenly portion this between my three pans, which I may utterly fail at, but... Mmm, that is jiggly. It smells kind of good once you get that quattro piece in there. It's not, it's not as metallic. It tastes more clovey or peppery. So then you just want to smack it around. Get all that liver flying all over the kitchen. <laughs> Just smack it really good, get it really nice and evenly dispersed. And then you want to fold the plastic over top if you're using it. If you're not, obviously you skip this step. So 
See how easy this is? It's really not a big deal. All right. Then we're going to put foil over that. And then, oh, where's that pan, Joe? The pan the liver was in. Awesome. So we're going we're to bake it in a water bath. And look, genius me turned off the oven. All right. Thank you, sir. 300. Sorry, I noticed that about the handout this morning. That was my edit note to myself that you accidentally got in your handout. What temperature? <laughs> I think that's the only other error besides the omission of garlic from the sausage recipe. I'm sorry. I'm sure y'all will catch me in another one. So I'm just going to put all these little babies in here together. And then I'm going to fill the casserole pan up to where the water is coming about halfway up each of these molds. And then I'm going to stick them in the oven in that water bath until they reach temperature. Because we're using pork products, we could theoretically cook this to about 140, 145. If we were using poultry products, we want to definitely bring it to 160. If you're using beef products, you could go even lower if you like your beef raw. With organs, you may not choose to eat it raw like you would a cut of meat, but it's just up to you. You'll have to trial and error it. Also, if you find that this recipe is a little dry for you later, then you can either cook it to a lower temp or you can add more panade or liquid in the emulsification process. Just know that you can tweak it. Know that you will mess up. It will be fine. I'm not putting in boiling water. I'm just putting in cold water because this, these things are already cold. I don't really want to shock the cold emulsification with boiling hot water around it. So this will take about an hour, maybe a little bit more. With poultry, it takes it takes at least an hour and a half, I would say. Those did. I might have overcooked them a tad bit. Um, so we'll just stick these right on in here. Also, these ovens, I've come to learn, are not calibrated. <laughs> so really, who knows what temperature we're cooking at. Um, a chef that I used to work for said, if somebody said, chef, what temp? He would be like, there's three oven temperatures, low, medium, and high. You just cook that thing low, you know? So that's what we're doing right now. We're just cooking it on low. The, the five, four, three ratio. Um, the five being the meat, the four being the blah, 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 where are we? That's uh, lean fat so and liquid is the order there. And are you, wh where does the, did you add fat to these? Sometimes you do, like if you were making bologna, for example, you would add fat. Um, with the liver pate, I don't. Gen I mean, the fat is coming in the form of cream and egg in this recipe, right? You know, and I have not done the math on this recipe. You know, it may not be the most shining example of that 543 ratio, but that is just the general ratio for an emulsification. And, and pâtés are a little bit more forgiving than, say, you're like mortadella, you know. So if you're making a mortadella or a bologna or a hot dog, you would want to be more spot on that 543 ratio. Whereas a pâté, it's like, well, I mean, just eat it out of the pan if it's crumbly or something, you know, it'll be fine. Um, and I thought this would be, what did you say? Mix it with mayonnaise. Yeah, mix it with mayonnaise. Just do something with it, right? So that would be good, a good opportunity to talk about smoking because a lot of emulsified products are then smoked afterward. So I just drew a picture of a really, really simple smoker. There's three different types of smoking that are kind of recognized in the smoking culture these days. That's cold, warm, and hot. And this is like this, the simplest cold smoker that you could ever, ever have. So you have a, a firebox of some kind. You have a way of, of pumping that smoke directly from the firebox into your smoking chamber. And the smoking chamber is where the meat hangs out. There's a place for the smoke to escape, and then there's a place somewhere down low where extra ventilation can move through the chamber. And so this is really easy. Sometimes these pipes are underground to keep the smoke nice and cold. Sometimes they're not. You can make this out of a cardboard box if you want to. You can get yourself a cardboard box. You can put an electric hot plate inside of it with a cast iron pan on top and some wood chips inside of that. And you can turn that sucker on and you can get a metal dryer vent and you can move it from the box to a wooden cabinet that you pulled off the kitchen wall. Put an S-hook in the kitchen cabinet, put your bacon inside of it, 
you know, put a little computer fan on the side of the cabinet and you've got yourself a cold smoker. Super simple. This is like the oldest way of smoking, the type of smoking that people in, either in really cold climates do year round, like in Alaska, this is how they do their salmon. Um, or like in, um, so, so we, know, we know like prosciutto or um, those Iberico hams are air dried, but in climates that didn't favor the right humidity and the right temperature for air drying, we came up with smoking because it preserves things more quickly and dries them more evenly. There are also volatiles in the smoke that inhibit molds, they inhibit bacteria, they change the product, they flavor the product. So really like, you may have a bologna from one, you know, so Lebanon bologna, which originated up in the Northeast, is always cold smoked, whereas bologna here in Appalachia is often hot smoked. And it's just basically what the traditions called for. A lot of the traditions came from what the climate called for. That's why hams here are smoked and sugar cured you know, whereas hams in Spain are air dried. They're all just, they're still cured hams, you know, just different ways of doing it. Um, this is like Laura Ingalls Wilder. This is like daddy puts up the hollowed out log, the hollowed out tree over here and starts a fire in it. And then the meat goes over somewhere else. And the fire in cold smoking, it's not really, it's not heat at all. That's why it's called cold smoking. So the temperature on the meat hardly ever gets above 75 degrees. Sometimes it's much lower than that. So really the smoke is more drying the product because remember dehydration is what ultimately preserves the meat. So the smoke is a drying factor and the smoke is intermittent and the smoke is always indirect. So the fire can go out, Mama Ingalls may go chop some wood and do something else, the fire may go out, she comes back the next morning, she starts another fire. And then this product will smoke for weeks, sometimes months. Um, in Germany, when they make uh, Speck, right? which is one of my absolute favorite charcuterie preparations. What that is is a bone, just like prosciutto, which is traditionally a bone-in ham, speck is a boned out ham that's cured just like a prosciutto in salt, and then it's hung up to ferment just like a prosciutto, but then after that it's cold smoked. And what they do in Germany, and I'm, I met a German guy in West Asheville, and he's like, let's make speck together, and I'm like, yes. So he's, what he's got is this little cabinet, and they put, it's generally always smoked using beech wood too, or maybe birch, I don't know, it's really specific. But they get sawdust from this tree, they make a coil out of sawdust and they just light that sawdust and it just smolders slowly over the course of like however long, a week or two it takes to smoke this ham. And so different types of wood will give you different types of smoke and different kinds of flavor. So beech and birch will give you a light smoke and a light flavor. Apple is one that will give you an intermittent smoke and a medium flavor. Hickory and mosquito, your heavy smokers, heavy flavorers. So you can really get super geeky, you know, you can kind of start seeing this, right? Like, oh, well I can, and when we learn about some of the different techniques of curing, you can cure something two ways, ferment it and smoke it. I mean, you can just kind of go wild with all, you know, you can choose your wood according to what kind of smoke, you know, effect you want, blah, blah, blah. Um, warm smoke is, Similar setup, the smoke can, is most likely indirect, just like this, but the temperatures can get a little bit hotter. So maybe the fire's a little bit closer to the meat, maybe the fire's steady and ongoing and raging, who knows. But those temperatures are generally like, it's in your handout, I don't really remember. I think it's like 140 to 180 or something, 75 to 140. And then hot smoking is what you see often for like bacon or tasso. That's something you can do at home. I mean, that's basically just where the fire is pretty direct. It can be indirect. But the fire and the smoke is pretty close to the meat. The meat is generally cooked in these applications because it's heating to a temperature where it's stable. Um, and the smoke is generally heavier and more consistent. So you can do that, you know, you can build a fire, you know, in your backyard and you can hang your bacon on top of it and you're hot smoking it, basically. You can smoke on, on a ceramic grill, which is what I do. How would you uh, store, like if you smoked ham and sausages, then how would you store it for the year? Um, a cool, a cool dark place. Yeah, you could store it in a cool dark place. You could freeze it at that point and then thaw it when you're ready to eat it. They'll keep pretty a pretty long time in the fridge after they've been smoked, especially if they're smoked and cooked, so smoked to temperature. And a lot of times, people who cold smoke are just keeping their product like in an ante, like sort of an ante chamber in the smoking room. So once they're done smoking, they're just moving them. And, and like around here, you can only cold smoke in the winter time. Like you're not, it's not gonna happen <laughs> any other time just because it's too hot in the summers. But you can easily keep your stuff outside, you know, at that point. 
Um, and around here, it's generally easy to cure outside, which we'll talk about you know, in the wintertime. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so like I said, it would be super cool to like build a smoker together or smoke some bacon, but we just don't have time. So that's a brief overview of, of smoking, and it's, it's really fun. It's really fun. There's a lot of room to play when you're smoking products. Um, so I thought, let's see, how's everybody doing? How's everyone feeling? How's morale? It's 3 o'clock. We feel good. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. So I didn't know if maybe everybody wanted to take some time. I gave you a little handout. I'm going to wash some things. But I gave you a little handout. It looks like a spreadsheet. And there's some ideas for sausage ingredients. If you would like to develop a sausage recipe right now, and if you feel intimidated, just take that one I gave you and start there. The same amount of lean meat, the same amount of fat, and the same amount of salt, and just add your flavors. And then when we're done, we're going to give you 20 minutes. Does that sound reasonable? All right, I'm going to give you 20 minutes. And then when we're done, if you want to do it in a group, that's fine too. That might be good like as a table so we don't end up with too many. And then we might, I have enough meat to make another sausage. So we may vote on whose is our favorite, and we'll make that sausage together. And then when it's time to eat, we can taste it. Does that sound like a fun, fun time? We have 20 minutes to do what? Make your own sausage up, OK? Please don't make it an emulsified product. That'll just make it harder for us later. Let's just do, let's stick to fresh sausage right now. And do you have all the ingredients that are listed uh, I have a lot of them. I'll tell you what I know I have. You can check it off really fast. I have nutmeg. I have cayenne, I have quattro a piece, I have cloves, coriander, fennel, rosemary, black pepper, juniper, brown sugar, a little bit of bourbon, sh regular sugar, salt. There's a bunch of them in the closet back there too. There's some chilies. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, black pepper and salt. There's, gar there's plenty of garlic. There's some onion. We can put onion in it. Um, there's lemon juice somewhere. There's pork stock cooking, if you're interested in that. There's herbal tea I can make you. There's cream. Yeah, just be imaginative. Shelf stability is measured by pH and water activity. And if you have a water activity or a pH meter, one or the other, then I think it's a pH below 5.2 and a water activity below 0.92 is considered shelf stable. So if you were to measure your smoke product, you may find that you could just wrap it in like wax or parchment. You're saying water activity below 9, what does that mean actually? So water activity is a measure of the available water in a product. So it doesn't mean the water that's there, it means the water that's available. Oh, thank you. So it means the water that's available for bacteria, basically. So if I have a piece of meat, a piece of fresh meat, usually starts out at a specific water activity. You can look it up in a book somewhere. If I put that meat in a freezer and it freezes solid, it has no water activity. Not because there's no water in there. It's just not available. It's frozen. If I take the meat back out of the freezer and that water thaws, it again has water activity. So when I cure a piece of meat, which is what we're going to talk about next, we're talking about whole muscle curing. They're going to move on to ground, ground fermentation. Um, the salt via osmosis draws water out of the product. Smoke via you know, time and the properties in the smoke draws water out of the product. And that is the ultimate preservation that happens in the meat. Everything else, the bacteria stuff, that's mostly just chemical reactions. It's physical coloring, it's flavoring, etc. cetera. Um, I do not measure pH and I do not measure water activity. I go by weight. Uh huh. Um, if I was, I mean, I, when I was doing retail, I was not necessarily selling some of the more sophisticated shelf stable products, you know, but if you were doing that in a commercial environment, you would be required to measure water activity and pH. On the home scale, <coughs> I think it's perfectly reliable to go by weight. So when um, you say go by weight, what does that You'll take the product out of smoke or out of the curing chamber when it has lost a certain amount of its original weight, usually 30 to 40 percent. Um, so where are we? Did you guys make a sausage recipe? You still working? Busy talking. All right. There's just a heart like hanging out on the counter. 
Oh, you know what else we're gonna do? Is we're gonna give away a bunch of stuff. Is everybody in here prepared to go home with anything? Or do you wanna be taken off the list for drawings? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna number everybody on this list and, and then I'm gonna put those numbers in a hat and we're gonna have some giveaways. Food or a book, there's a book. Oh, I got it. I'm just like listening to y'all make your sausage recipes. You did it? Nice. Okay, yep. Okay. Maybe I can help you. Do you do ounces or grams or what? A tablespoon uh, in terms of ounces is a half ounce. A tablespoon is a half ounce. Yeah. Oh, you mean the meat? Um, it would have more like the same effect on the meat as a brine might have. So um, I don't think in terms of a fresh sausage, you would have to worry about it affecting too much the meat. It may make it a little bit more tender. Say you had some sow meat that you knew you wanted to grind, but you didn't want it to be chewy. You might use an acidic liquid in your sausage like pineapple juice or orange juice. A little bit of a tenderizing thing, yeah. And I mean, citrus and vinegar liquids are my favorite, like wines and citrus. So I just think they're really, they offer a really nice balance to sweeteners. They offer a really nice balance to um, salt. Just a little tip as you go, and I'm sure you guys are all very good cooks, but general components in um, good food, salt, fat, acid, and sweetener. And the more you can balance those things, the, be the better. So if you've got something spicy, add a little tinge of sweetness to it. If you've got cayenne in your sausage, put a tiny bit of nutmeg, for example. If you've got uh, a bunch of wine in it, then maybe you want to add a little brown sugar at the same time. Okay, well, who's going to read their recipe first? What? It has what in it? Bourbon. Just bourbon, no salt? Just bourbon. Well, unfortunately, we don't have enough bourbon to make your sausage, so you're not going to win. That's a good idea, though. This is sort of what we do is um, two ounces of sage, half an ounce of black pepper, um, one ounce of black pepper, not half an ounce, and um, two tenths ounce of thyme, um, 0.4 ounces of cayenne, 0.2 of crushed red pepper, and 0.2 of marjoram. And we put that in the same ratio. So that's like that a breakfast sausage. Yeah, mm -hmm. breakfast sausage. So without the fennel. Right. Okay. We have done yeah. fennel. Some of us like that, and some of us don't. That sounds pretty good. What else we got? Um, I mean, we weren't really looking at ratios, but Mr. Bertain had a pretty good idea for sage, salt, pepper, and garlic, so just a basic Basic sausage. breakfast. That's what nice. I used when we made the duck sausage, too. The duck sausage? Yeah. Yummy. It was. Anybody else? We did one with cream, liquid, and then white pepper, cinnamon, red pepper, nutmeg, and salt. Ooh, that sounds like a bratwurst. That sounds really good. We served mm -hmm. with marinara. Mm. Anybody else? I thought a peach garlic. What's that? Peachy garlic. Peach and garlic? Sage. Mm. That does sound sure. good. Now y'all went and created stuff that I don't have, so <laughs> how are we going <laughs> to... Run to Walmart. Anything else? We got a... Uh, we had a breakfast sausage with onion, sage, brown sugar, IPA, mustard, and salt. Right. Mustard is mine. Good job, good job. Anybody we else? Started, we, we started with bourbon yeah. again. And, uh, we're thinking of lamb, bourbon and lamb, allspice, cinnamon, nutmeg, red pepper, fennel, garlic, onion, and bay leaf. Ooh, yummy. Mm -hmm. 
think lamb and bourbon would be a good mixture? Sure, of course. <laughs> bourbon and I like both of them. Lamb bourbon. Yeah. Well, what do you guys think? Did y'all have anything before? Well, I did one just because I like to play around with ginger, black pepper, paprika, onion, anise, salt, sage, thyme, and wine. Mm. Yeah. Sounds great. In a breakfast sausage, like you're just cooking in, do you still need the liquid? Usually. Yeah, we've never added liquid. Really? In our, huh. our sausage. So maybe that's something we can right. do. Should you try it? See what you think. You may like better without beer. You know. But I mean, in terms of just like moisture, mouthfeel, eating experience, keeping quality, you want a little bit of moisture in there, I think, you know. Um, yeah, do you put sugar in yours? No. No sugar. That's one reason we developed this is because of dietary issues. don't want the sugar. Issues. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Well, does anybody um, feel excited to make their sausage? Not the straight bourbon people, because I, I only have like... <laughs> I only have like a tablespoon of bourbon left. Do we feel excited about one or what happened to that little one of those recipes? Ginger green people one? Is that y'all? Or you, ma'am? I know you had ginger. Y'all had ginger too, right? We had cinnamon. You had ginger. Nutmeg. All right, who wins, y'all? Come on, duke it out. <clears throat> We're going back and forth. Take flip, a vote. Flip a coin. Flip yeah, a, flip coin. a coin. So which one? I like the bratwurst. Who had that? The bratwurst sounding thing. The cream? Yeah. Yeah, we had that one. Raise your hand if you want to make the bratwurst. What makes it a bratwurst? Read us your recipe again. Yeah. <laughs> it was cream, white pepper, cinnamon, red pepper flake, nutmeg, and salt. Mm, that sounds good. So what would make a bratwurst? Well, bratwurst is traditionally a lot of those sweeter, earthier spices with a cream and egg element in it. So it's not necessarily a bratwurst, but it sounded similar to a bratwurst. Um, like a, a, a boudin blanc also has cream in it, so I could have said, ooh, that sounds like a boudin blanc, but doesn't have any cook. Usually also a boudin blanc has like cooked, cooked vegetables in it or cooked rice or sauteed onions and peppers. So it is really more like a bratwurst than a boudin blanc, but just saying. Bratwurst isn't the only sausage that would have cream in it. I had some leftover... Um, pork belly earlier, so I braised it. I'm just gonna pass it around. You guys can have a piece. It's not cured. It's not charcuterie. It's just extra meat. <laughs> okay, so I thought we would talk about the head cheese really fast. I don't know if it's done yet, but um, this is, so the cousin, I guess, of the pate, right, is the terrine. Wow, Pat. That's really cool. <laughs> Let me get a ladle. <laughs> How was this pork belly cooked? What did you do with it? Uh, hold on. So I braised it. So I braised it with oranges, celery, onion, garlic, coriander, fennel, mustard, and red wine. Um, so I sauteed all those things with the pork belly as it browned. Then I did a red wine reduction and I put it all in the oven with a tight cover, poured more wine over it, salt, pepper, and let it cook at about 300 until it was done. And people always say like, how long did you cook that? I say, till it's done. Because it's really temperature based. It's not like amount of time. Um, so the way you know that if your head cheese is done usually is if the jaw is loose and I can't get to the jaw because this is very full so I'm just taking some liquid off the top. It smells delicious. Can you all smell it? Again, this is a very simple head cheese recipe. This is the same recipe that's in the book. You've got it in your handout. You can play with it. You can add to it. You can change it up. Oh, by the way, one of the best pâtés that I ever put in my mouth had coffee grounds in it. Just so you know. Just throwing that out there for you. Here's the tongue. So is the recipe for this pork belly in your book? No. Well, no, not really. That's delicious. Probably the two best parts on the pig when you took a whole pig. Tongue and jowls. Tongue and the what? Tongue and the jowls. And the jowls. Yeah, we're going to cure some jowls today. Meredith, how do you get the hair off the head? 
You use a razor and shave it. Like a little plastic, little pink plastic razor. That's what I do. That's what you do when you kill a hog and you can't get the hair off of certain spots is you gotta shave it. Ow. Could you singe it off too? Yeah, that's what the big slaughter... That's what the big slaughterhouses do is they... Mm -hmm. Screwing it up? Yeah. Just burn it. Oh, really? That's what they did when they couldn't get the feathers? Really a delightful odor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Please burn, burn the hair off. Have, have. You, want some? Can you, just burn the hair off? you can, but I just, I mean, you got to be real careful. Yeah. You can Singe the skin. Singe the skin, and then. Right. Yeah. You want to work on getting this head out of here um, so I can talk about it? Yeah. Be careful, it's hot. We're trying to figure out if the jaw is loose and it's done, okay. but I can't tell because it's upside down. Um, so what we'll do, we, what we did with the head is I brined it overnight. Actually, it brined almost 35 hours. I got all this meat on Thursday, with the exception of the lovely livers that Amy brought. Um, I put the pig's head, I took the jowls off, put the pig's head in a brine that is in, the recipe is in your handout. I think it was like a box of kosher salt to like a gallon and a half of water. And I added a little bit of cold water on top of that, so the, the salinity degree went down a bit because of that. Um, I just wanted the head covered, so I had to add a little extra cold water. I put an, a tongue in there, and I put an extra piece of skin just to up the gelatin that would come out in the cooking process. Brined it in that um, about 30 hours in the fridge, in that bucket. And then right before class, I rinsed it really thoroughly, put it in a pot with leeks, onion, carrot, rosemary, a little bit of parsley, garlic, black pepper, rosemary, I said that already, cloves some other stuff, juniper berries, and we've just been boiling it. We've boiled it now for what? Two hours? It may take a little bit longer. It may take us another hour or two to get it where we want it. So Mary, how close is head cheese to South's meat? It's the because same. Mm -hmm. Because I know the South's is gelatinous and some South is wonderful. Mm -hmm. but I was it's pretty much the same thing. I think the difference is that it doesn't necessarily have to be meat from the head. Okay. So it can just be a terrine made with whatever meat and flavored however, you know? And so it's just a more general term for a, like a, a terrine of um, pork, okay. you know? What was the term you used? You got it, Pat? Can you just like mess with the jaw with what that knife? What I think I might do is go up and get um, Get a, um, a fork, you know, a big fork, like a meat fork. Well, maybe you can just lift it up really fast like you were, and I'll okay, reach. Okay, I can do that. It's just that if I try and lift Team up the, the knife that I'm using for my grab. Yeah, it's bending. really bending. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, he's not done yet. Let's put him back in. Should I flip him so that that ends in, so that this is on top? If we can. I think we can. I don't want you to get splashed. Things not to do by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now though you need more liquid because it's no longer in the liquid. Hmm. Maybe it, yeah. it's some, there's always some parts that's gonna stick up. It's just bigger than this pot. You know? We get a big pot. It's getting there though. You see how soft it is. Mm -hmm. Should mm -hmm. I add more liquid back in? Well, I've got this. Yeah. I mean, if we put the lid on, it'll be steaming even if it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was a nice little uh, moment that we had there. Thanks, Pat. Okay, so when it is done, and I'm going to go ahead and explain it because when it is done, we'll get it out, it'll cool for a while, but then at some point, we're just going to get a team of people picking it so that we can have it later. And, it, and we may not be able to eat it in its true, most perfect form because in that, if we did that, it would need to chill overnight, but we're going to eat it later anyways. Um, so what would happen is we would take the head out, we would cool it until it was cool enough to handle and touch. We would strain the broth that we had made to get all the little peppercorns and everything out of it. I've reserved a little bit of parsley that I've chopped because I like to have a little bit of green in there. When I make head cheese, so 
I like to have the, the stock as clear as possible. Um, so I don't use certain things. Like I wouldn't use my onion peels. I wouldn't use my potato peels. I wouldn't use my celery leaves. I want a clear, pretty, neutral stock. Um, so what I did when I was chopping onions for the pâtés and everything, I took the ends and the skins and I put them in this pot with some bones that I took out of a loin yesterday and I'm making just a regular stock for us to eat when we eat dinner or do whatever we want to do with. And then I put the pure, like the centers of the leeks and the whiter vegetables and stuff into the head cheese. We'll want to strain it really well. Then we will pull all the meat off and the fat, just anything that we can possibly get off the head. We can peel the skin off the tongue and we can cube it up. We can cut it. It's not going to pull apart probably, but you can cut it up. Um, get everything to just like little bits. We'll put it in the bowl and then we'll mix in a little bit of vinegar. We'll mix in that parsley at that point, probably some salt and pepper, some pretty simple seasonings. We can do whatever we want really. You might want to put the rest of the bourbon in there, Amy. Um, so we'll mix that all around and then we'll put it in a loaf. I've got some loaf pans, so we'll just pack it in and then we'll pour over it some of our strained aspic that we have derived from the boiling process. And then you'd want to put it in the fridge, cover it, well, you wouldn't put it in the fridge, we'd cover it, weight it somehow, which is what we'll also do with these pâtés when they come out of the oven. Um, they kind of rise, right, when they're cooking, so you want to press them down. I usually use like an ingrained maple cutting board or a cutting board with wine bottles or milk jugs on top of it. Um, let it come to room temperature on the counter, and then once it's at room temperature, you put it weighted in the fridge and let it chill overnight before you eat it. So that's the basic process. But when it comes, if we get the head cheese right, it'll come out, it's so beautiful. It's like pieces of meat, this very clear aspect around it, and then the little bits of green in <coughs> the parsley, it's amazing. And I have pulled easily eight pounds of meat off of a head before. So this is one of the things that I really harp on, that a lot of heads are going in the waste can in America, and there are hungry people and hungry dogs and there's eight pounds of meat on that head. If I don't pull the jowls off, there's likely 18 pounds of meat, 12 to 18 pounds of meat on a head. So it's really important to make head cheese if you can stomach it, because it is kind of gross to pick out eyeballs and pick through skulls. The first time I did it, I was like, ooh, you know? But now it's not, it's not so bad. <coughs> oh, I just boiled it with the eyeballs in it, and you can put it, you can smush them up in the head cheese if you want. Or you can take them out and not use them. Some people split the skull in half with the saw before they make it so they can scoop the brains out and put it in the head cheese. I didn't do that here because I was in a hurry and like I said, I'm moving and I couldn't find my saw and so I was like, okay, we're just gonna. We're not gonna use the brains. No, I mean, unless somebody feels like well, I wanna hulk out and smash the skull open, but then you gotta worry about having bone fragments in there and whatnot, it's just a lot of trouble, you know? But, um, but you've cooked it right now with the brains in right The brains are in it. They're just hard to get out. Right. Unless you get in through the skull somehow. So, you, you can try. This is your class. Um, okay, so that's kind of our terrine. Like I said, if we weren't doing something that it itself has a lot of collagen in it, then we would need to make an aspic. And how we would do that is, and I'm going to give away a, ha um, a trotter. I have a hawk and a trotter that somebody might like to keep. Smoke a hawk if you want to. It's really good for soups. But you could pickle a pig's foot. The trotter being the foot, the hawk being the hind shank, essentially. Four shank, my bad, four shank. So it's like that lower arm bone. Yeah. Um, so I have that. So a lot of times, like the, if you see a smoked hawk, it's just that shank bone, and then the trotter's the foot, and that's why they kind of have separate names. So I have a hawk and a trotter I can give away. I also have just a foot and a rolled up piece of skin that I'm willing to give away. And that may seem like not a very good prize, but it is because if you want to make gelatin to use in future aspects, or if you're going to make, you know, whatever, pudding, then you can make your own gelatin by boiling the foot, boiling the skin, and then the liquid that you strain off is going to be really rich in collagen. And the beautiful thing about hydrocolloids like gelatin, like carrageenan, like agar, is that they can be manipulated to be runny or solid, depending on their temperature, depending on whether they've been blended. They're very freaky. If you want some cool mad scientist cooking stuff, go to cookingissues.com and look up hydrocolloids and just read all about them. But gelatin is one of the 
easiest, most natural hydrocolloids. And what's cool about gelatin is when it's warmed up and melts and it's liquid, but when it cools, it solidifies. So it gives us lots of different um, options for cooking applications. Um, it's also very good for you. Hydrocolloids. It's just a group of compounds that are used in cooking. So if you've ever seen like those tiny little ice cream quenelles and like fancy restaurants, those are made using like agar or carrag usually carrageenan for ice cream. But it's like, it's just using different hydrocolloids too. I have a friend out in Hendersonville who's a real geek about this kind of stuff. But they're really popular with like the, um, like uh, molecular gastronomy people and, and they're just cool. You just do really cool stuff with them. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody else knows this. I discovered it because I was trying to make an insecticide. But if you take the tough part of these garlic scapes, you know, if you break them off, you then snap them like asparagus. Yeah. Everybody know what a garlic scape is? Mm -hmm. It's the, the flour that you got to take off the garlic so it won't oh, get too okay. small. Um, and you take that tough part and you boil it up and then run it through some kind of sieve or something, it makes an aspic. Does it? Yeah. It makes awesome. what now? It makes an aspic. Okay. Yeah. The tough That's part. Cool. No, the, the top the part, part, the part that you wouldn't the eat. The bottom part. Yeah. Bottom, the top part is tough, too. Yeah. Well, okay. you chop that up fine, you can eat it. You don't want to eat the bottom part. You know, right. You've been chewing on it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give away, I'm going to draw right now. I'm going to give away some skin and some feet. Ready? Okay. So, you can make some gelatin. If you wanted to put, say, a bunch of cook a bunch of vegetables or marinate maybe white wine and vinegar and a bunch of herbs and you marinate a bunch of beautiful asparagus say and then you blanch it or you saute it and then you put it in a loaf pan and you make yourself an aspic right with the gelatin maybe you put a little balsamic vinegar in it you make it really pretty pour it over your asparagus you made yourself a vegetable terrine beautiful all your friends will be so impressed the winner is number 12 who is Tia Bednar right on so you have waiting for you in the fridge before you go home some skin and some feet all right uh, uh, not really I mean I think the skin that I'm giving you is from the shoulder um, I just took, it doesn't have a lot of fat on it because I was, as I was pulling it off, I was trying to keep the fat on the meat. So it's going to be best for making gelatin. Another thing you do with it is you can cut it into squares and you can bake it in the oven. And then you have these little cooked skin. You can smoke them. You can roll it up and smoke it and give it to your dog. You can put it in the freezer after you smoked it and then put it in your beans later. There's a million things that you can do. You can give it to your friend who's a tattoo artist. They can practice. Um, <laughs> The skin that I'm giving to Tia came off of the shoulder that I broke down in order for us to make sausage. I know, but where did you get that? Did you just buy a whole pig? No, I bought, uh, so what I bought for today's class was an entire shoulder. So the picnic, the butt, the butt being the upper part of the shoulder, the picnic being the lower part of the shoulder, it had the foot attached. Um, I bought a, an entire loin, which is all the meat from the shoulder to the hip with the bone in it. Um, and I've brought with me um, some meat that I have been keeping in a friend's freezer so long that I thought he might kill me. Um, a ham, which we'll break down later to talk about good trim and bad trim. Um, and I brought some hocks and skin from there. Um, a head, I bought the head. And That's about it. This was a butcher that did not take off the skin. Right, so their the processor, processor is singeing all the hair off so that you can keep the skin, which is what you want for charcuterie in general, because if you're smoking a product, the skin will keep moisture in the product and can easily be removed afterwards. Did you have to tell us, if not right now, where these processors are? Mm -hmm. Sure. The, the pig that I bought for this came from Foothills Deli and Butchery, and it was processed at Wells Jenkins and Wells Meat Processing in Forest City, North Carolina. Wells? Wells Jenkins. Um, I know Mays Meats and Taylorsville skins hogs, so if you want skin, it's hard to get it processed there. Um, I don't know. Does anybody work with a processor that keeps the skin on that you want to throw out the name? No. Okay. Wells Jenkins is your person then. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, if you do it yourself, you can maybe singe to your heart's content. What's that? I said maybe the hunter might have that. It's a pork place in eastern North Carolina. They specialize in pork. They grow their oh. own pork and do all of their their own processing. Okay. Even making lard there. What's it called? Nahunta. N a h u n t a. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I've heard of them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's out from Goldsboro, the area called yeah. Pikesville, and yeah. they have another store in Raleigh as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're going out east, there's a great processing plant called Acre Station Meat Plant out there way east and they they do leave the skin on they make bacon they do all kinds of cool stuff they're working a lot with um, farmers on heritage breeds and hog carcass yields and stuff like that which we can talk about if you're raising hogs and you're looking at like lean to fat ratio we can talk about that a little bit later because it is breed dependent and it is um, it has bearing on charcuterie yields versus fresh cut yields and it's pretty fascinating um, but right now we're gonna make some bacon and talk about whole muscle cures so we're moving on. We've done fresh sausage, we've done emulsified sausage, and now we are going into whole muscle curing. There's two different ways to cure whole muscles, and that is exactly what it sounds like. It's the entire muscle, or a piece of muscle, that you don't grind up at all, you just keep it intact and you cure it that way. So a, a classic example of a whole muscle cure is bacon, and we're gonna be doing a wet cure and a dry cure. These are two ways to do, approach whole muscle cures. Dry cure being salt, sweetener, some form of nitrate usually, spices. You roll the product in that mixture, then you store it in cold storage as the salt via osmosis draws the water out of that meat. It's not going to draw it all the way out. You won't take it out of the fridge and it'll be shelf stable, right? We have to then do other things to it, like smoke it um, or ferment it. But that curing step is an essential step. Originally, all sausages included a curing step. In the old days when they first developed sausages, there would always be a nitrate, usually potassium nitrate or saltpeter would be added to the meat. It would stay in the fridge. It would receive that osmotic action that would draw some of the water out. The meat would tenderize, it would flavor. Then they would stuff it into casings and whether or not they were gonna cook it right away or smoke it or dry it, whatever. Now we skip that step because we know that we can produce a good quality fresh sausage without a curing step. And <coughs> with increasing concerns over nitrates, we know that we can eliminate this, that step if needed. Um, today we will be using nitrates because I wanted the opportunity to talk about them. Um, so what we have, and the reason we didn't deal with them with the pâtés, and the reason we didn't deal with them with sausages is because those products are cooked. So the purpose of nitrates are coloring, um, but mostly preserving. So what they do is they inhibit botulism. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I need some water. Um, they will interact with meat proteins as well as bacteria to cause the spores of botulism to insist. And what that means is that those little spores are putting a protective membrane around themselves to keep themselves from dying. And if you eat them, you will just pass them through. They won't hurt you. Um, so that's what the nitrate for, is for. It is thusly very important to have it because botulism is deadly. Um, I have a friend, a very good friend, a butcher, and I've told this story before, I tell in all my charcuterie classes, who got botulism last year. She, um, and I don't know if you've heard stories about botulism, but what it does is it paralyzes you from the waist up. So <clears throat> she ate some canned carrots. And this is a woman who's been canning for years, decades, who canned some carrots, didn't have her acidity quite right. They were, you know, sealed, put on the shelf cracked open, not cooked, eaten. She had just gotten a filling in her tooth. So the botulism spore went straight into her bloodstream and like got into her brain behind her eye. It was really bad. She started to go blind. She couldn't speak. She thought she was dying. Her daughter took her to the hospital. She was in the hospital for 85 days on a ventilator. She had to learn to walk again, talk again, everything. So this is, I mean, this is something that took only probably half a micron of this particular bacteria, Clostridium botulinum, in order to nearly kill this woman, right? So this is something that's, that, that's just very serious. And that is the purpose of a nitrate. The nitrate is the only thing we know of besides cooking at temperature for at least 20 minutes that will stop botulism from its harmful effects. Um, there is a lot of controversy around nitrates. Um, 
curing salts, the ones that are used in charcuterie are typically, um, there are two kinds. One is uh, curing salt number one or pink salt. It's often pink. That is sodium nitrite. The white one or cure number two, some, in some places cure two is also pink, but in America it's usually white, which is weird because the purpose of dyeing it pink is so that you can tell it from table salt. But cure two is white, just like table salt, so you have to be really careful. Cure two is sodium nitrite nitrate. So what this is is a more complex form of, nit of nitrogen that needs to be broken down into nitrite. So nitrite is the simpler form, more readily available, more fast, you know, quickly available. Nitrate breaks down in a slow release reaction from nitrate to nitrite and then attacks the botulism. So cure number two, being the slow release form, is used for longer curing products. Cure number one is used primarily for coloring, because some people do use nitrates just for color. Um, it's used for cooked products, quick cured products, um, so if you know you don't have a long cure, you use cure number one. So here's the thing about nitrates is that they're naturally occurring. They occur in huge quantities in the stems of leafy vegetables. Um, kale, celery has a lot of nitrate in it. That's why substitutes for nitrate curing salts are often derived from celery juice. Um, so if you see like a naturally cured product, you'll see it's cured with celery juice extract. Um, I've used that product before. If you're more comfortable with that product because it's a naturally occurring form of nitrate, I certainly understand. The only thing about celery juice powders is that the concentrations of nitrate are, is not necessarily known with, from batch to batch. So, <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't say that it's risky. You know, if you're using enough of it, you know you have enough nitrate there to cure the product. But the thing about these products is that we know exactly what cure we're going to get per pound of meat when we're using them. And so in the commercial environment, in the teaching environment, this is what I teach people to use. The federal regulations are a teaspoon of cure number one and up to four teaspoons of cure number two per five pounds of ground meat. And that is, so for a hundred, so let's take a big batch of salami, right? A hundred pounds of meat, four teaspoons of cure number one are going into a hundred pounds of meat. Not only is that a pretty small amount, you know, when you take in all the other ingredients that are going in there, but also in the products that we are really crucial that we have a nitrate in those products, those products are changing drastically from the time that we make them and add the nitrates and add the ingredients to the time that we harvest them because what's going on inside are all kinds of chemical reactions, all kinds of biological reactions with bacteria, meat proteins, sweeteners, salts. And those nitrates are metabolized by those bacteria, which means they're broken down. So the actual amount of nitrate that you ingest is pretty small. And so the perspective that I like to give about this is, you know, four teaspoons of nitrate per 100 pounds of meat, you know, that's not very much nitrate going into my body when I eat a bite, but it takes only a tiny speck of botulism to kill me dead. So I just think it's really important for us to not be so freaked out about nitrates as the media has allowed people to be. As, I mean, some people say, I eat salami with nitrates and I get sick. And if that is the case, then absolutely try to limit them as much as possible. If I'm cooking something, if I know I'm hot smoking a bacon, I'll leave it out. I don't use it if I don't have to. But I do use it when I know I have to. And so, <coughs> for example, I am going to be cold smoking the bacon that we make today. The Canadian bacon that we make today, I'm going to be giving away to someone. And I don't know how you're going to cook it, so we're going to use a nitrate, right? So we, that just, we just know we've got it covered. So what I have done is um, made a master dry cure, which I can give you the recipe for. This is a base for any dry cure you want to do. It's three and a half ounces of kosher salt. Oh, and a really quick note about salt. I didn't really talk about it. Um, I use Morton's, that's the one with the umbrella, right? The little girl. Yeah, that's, I use it just because I like the little girl with the umbrella, not because I care. Some people are really um, weird about which kind of kosher salt they use. Um, Diamond Crystal is the other main brand. The point of it is that you just have to weigh it because Diamond Crystal is exactly what it sounds like. It's a little hollow crystal, whereas a Morton's kosher salt is a flattened, compressed flake, and they weigh a different amount. So a tablespoon of, of Morton's weighs different from a tablespoon of diamond crystal. So to get your ratios right, you just have to weigh everything. 
That's the only aside. You can use sea salt, of course, but sea salt has other minerals in it. It's sometimes inconsistent. You have to use more of it. So if you want to be able to rely on your recipe or your ratio, it's best to just use kosher salt. We're, not, we're going to cure a prosciutto later if we have time, and I'll use Himalayan pink salt for that because that's traditional. Um, but you, you can use kosher salt. What are the consequences of using too much cure? Like if you just, I've seen people make bacon and they just pack that stuff mm -hmm. on there. Well, I mean, I guess you could argue that the consequences may be declining health over time if nitrates, in fact, I mean, my argument about, my, about nitrates and nitrogen is that we're part of the nitrogen cycle. Nitrates are part of our environment. We're getting nitrates from leafy vegetables. I think the research shows that if you sat down and just ate celery, you know, if, if like you sit down and you eat a bunch of celery and you sit down and you eat a bunch of cured meat, you'll die faster because the celery will have more nitrate in it. So nitrate poisoning would be the consequence of too much nitrate, but it's really hard to do. I mean, you would have to sit, I think the research shows you'd have to sit and just sit there and eat 20 pounds alone of cured meat in order to just get sick. And that's not even die, like that's get sick, you know? Yeah, you get sick anyway. And you could say, oh, it's nitrate. Or you could be like, no, it's your gluttony, right? Why? Um, so yeah, I think, you know, sometimes it will affect the flavor, I think, you know? I mean, it does, so nitrate, sodium nitrite, cure number one, it's like 0.4% nitrite and the rest is table salt. So it's just salty, you know? And the more you use, and you have to factor in most recipes have this factored in, but you factor in the nitrate that you're using into your salt ratio so that you're not overkilling the product with salt. You know? um, we're talking about um, whole muscle curing right now. So the recommendations for nitrate for whole muscle curing will be higher than those for ground muscle because like we said earlier, ground meat has a greater surface area. So you're gonna cure it faster. The nitrate's gonna be able to act on it faster and more easily. So whole muscles, I think they up it by four. So it's like a whole muscle for cure one, you can use up to four teaspoons per 100, for five pounds, excuse me. Um, and then cure two, I'm not sure what the regs are off the top of my head for whole muscles, but it is a bit higher. When you're wet curing products, then the regulations allow for higher nitrate because it's suspended in water and you're you know, the product can only take up as much of that cure as it will fit, you know, as it can hydrate with that brine. So <clears throat> we'll kind of get into that in a minute. But what we have here is dry cure, which I started to give you the recipe for, and then I went off on a tangent. Um, <clears throat> it's three and a half ounces of kosher salt, 1.75 ounces of brown sugar, and the proper amount of nitrite, cure number one. So I made this for... 40, no, 25 pounds of meat. So you do the math based on knowing that five pounds of meat need a teaspoon. Well, right, so for your recipe, I'm pretty much giving you the recipe right now for a five pound piece of meat. So you want three and a half pounds of salt, 1.75 pounds of sugar, and a teaspoon of cure number one. And then you can do the math to extrapolate if you want more. Um, I, I tend to mix this up and just keep it around. Because if I have, another great thing you can do is make salt pork. And that's like, if I have scraps, like that pork belly, for example, if I didn't want to braise it for y'all today, um, maybe what I would have done is just cut it up and then I have some dry cure in my cabinet. I can roll it in the dry cure, stick it in the fridge and just let it, those pieces cure. And then when I am making marinara sauce, I will rinse one of those, add it to the pot, add it to beans, add it to whatever. It's really tasty. So that's another option. Um, so what we'll do here is we're gonna cure some belly we're gonna cure some jowl, um, and we'll talk about some of the different applications. Let me pull. So when you say that the cure number one and number two are mostly salt with some nitrate. Yeah, so cure number one, I know for sure, is 0.4% nitrite and 9.96, you know, whatever, 96% table salt. And then nit sodium nitrite nitrate obviously has a greater amount of nitrate product in it, but I don't know the exact breakdown between nitrate, nitrite, and then table salt, but it is mostly table salt. Um, excuse me while I get some meat. This is pork belly. Because we're making bacon, I left the skin on. 
Because it'll be smoked, the skin, like I said, is gonna keep the moisture in a little bit better. The difference between pancetta and bacon is basically one is smoked and one is not. So I could take the skin off of this, leave the skin on this, cure it the same way. The bacon I would smoke, the pancetta I would hang up, and that would be the difference. Some people like to add slightly different nuanced flavors to one or the other, um, but that's the chief difference. So I'm kind of gonna do that application with these jowls. So these are the jowls that I pulled off of the pig's head that we're cooking. This is the masseter muscle right here that goes right in that pocket, that's the jaw muscle, and the rest of it is effectively the jowl. I'm gonna keep the masseter on there, but you can pull it off and put it in your grind. It is quite different from the rest of it. Um, but I skinned one of the jowls because I'm going to dry cure it, but then I'm gonna hang it up for guanciale. And then the other one, I left the skin on to dry cure and smoke for jowl bacon. It's pretty much the only difference. A Little bit of hair on there. Um, in your master recipe, you put, you put the salt and sugar by weight, mm -hmm. and the cure you did by volume. Is that because it's always constant? You don't have to worry about Well, that? I can tell you the weight. It's 0. 0.2 ounces. Okay. I mean, I just wondered. I just figured that was easier than uh, okay. telling you. 0. 0.2 ounces? 0. 0.2. I think, I think that's about a, table, a teaspoon. Um, Hairs all over this mess. All right, so what I'm gonna do is very simply roll these around in the cure. I know my ratios are right. I've already mixed everything up. I've just sh shook it around. So I'm just gonna rub the cure. And then what I can do is I can add to it. So what, you know, on my guanciale, I might add some bay leaf. I might add some you know, juniper. So I can do that really fast. There's, pepper in there? What's it? There's no pepper in it. It's just it's salt, brown sugar, sugar, salt, brown sugar, and cure. And this, I mean, if you are in a pinch and you just really need some bacon, this will do you just fine. I would add some garlic, maybe. But, you know, you can get creative with it. So what I'll do right now as I go is I will throw, I'm going to throw some stuff in. Let's throw in some thyme. Let's put some pepper. Let's put some rosemary. Let's grind up some juniper. Let's grind up some bay. I got fresh bay leaves. Do you? Well, I have like a half a bay leaf left that I'm going to go ahead and use. What is guanciale? Guanciale is just a dry cured and then fermented pig jowl. And it's really easy. It's one of the, like the gateway cures. Like it's a really easy whole muscle ferment to make. You can ferment it slowly in the refrigerator, you know, so you don't have to worry about like a curing chamber or whatever. What's it called? Guanciale. It's spelled G-U-A-N-C-I-A-L-E. Where do you buy the cure locally? Uh, you don't. I don't know anywhere you can get them locally. How about like I buy them online. I don't know. You'd have to call them and see if they sell it. I order it from Butcher Packer usually. Um, same with like I'm ordering my casings anyway. I order some of my equipment, you know. Um, all right, so I just put all this stuff in the just to have fun. I don't know what the ratios are. I don't care. I'm putting them in the um, coffee grinder. is cool. You just walk away. And then it turns off all by itself, I think. So if you're anti-plastic, which I would like to be more anti-plastic than I am, you can cure in glass containers as long as they have lids. But since I'm sending some of this home with y'all, I'm using Ziploc bags. Stainless works okay. Glass is better. Plastic buckets are fine as long as you're curing in a refrigerator or a cold enough environment. Anything anaerobic, botulism. So you gotta make sure it's cold. And you gotta make sure you got nitrate. If you're curing without a nitrate and you're curing outside and it's hot, well, you're asking for it. Oh, I'm gonna put this on there.
Look how pretty that is. So I'm gonna put the same exact seasonings on my jowl bacon and my guanciale. I'm gonna smoke one of them and I'm gonna hang the other one up and we'll see what happens. <laughs> yep, I'm gonna put them in this bag. And the general rule for a dry cure is you wanna leave it in refrigeration with the cure on it, one day per pound. If it's a small thing like this, if it's a big old ham with a bone in it, three days per pound. So you would wanna weigh this. Um, which I can do. I'm not giving you all this guanciale, I'm keeping it. But I'll give away the jowl bacon. And there's a little bit of jowl bacon for us to eat later. We'll, we'll get Michelle to cook it up when she gets here. So we need a Sharpie. You know what? I do not like that one. I'm going to use the one. There was one over here. Sharpie? Oh, here it is. Yeah, Sharpie would be great. So what I do is, in, and we can talk about this later when we talk about prosciutto but usually what I do whenever I do a dry cure is I write down the percentages like if I use a specific percentage of salt and a specific percentage of nitrate that was different from like what I just gave you I would write that on the bag I would write the starting weight on the bag so this is 113 um, jowl for guanciale um, so I know it really only needs to stay in cure for like two days before I hang it up. So what I will do, anytime you cure something, once you're done with that, that curing step, so in two days, I'll pull this out of the refrigerator. Actually, missed a thing. When it's curing, you want to flip it over in equal times so it just gets an even cure because it'll start to leach, like you said. The osmosis will start pulling the water activity down. So you just want, and it doesn't have, I mean, every day is ideal, but if you go like stay the night with your lover or something and you got two days on this side, then just make it two days on this side. It just has to be even. Um, so then this will come out after two days. It will get rinsed thoroughly, which kind of breaks your heart a little bit, but you have to do it because otherwise it'll just taste bad and be too salty. So you rinse it off and then dry it as good as you can, wrap it in cheesecloth and hang it up. And you can hang it in the fridge or you can hang it in a more ideal environment with a tiny bit higher humidity, which we'll talk about when cred is up in a little bit. Um, and then you want to take it down when it's lost 30% of its original weight, which you wrote on the bag. And then you've made guanciale, easy peasy. The bacon, I'll do the same. I'll put it in a bag, um, put it in the fridge, probably, you know, a couple days. You could leave it a little bit longer if you wanted, but it can, it can get a little salty. I'll put it in there. Rinse it off. Get it really dry. If you're going to smoke something, try to get it as dry as you possibly can before you smoke it. I like to make tasso. It's one of my favorite. We have, if it's not, if it's still good, <laughs> we'll eat it later. Um, but I made some tasso out of sirloin. It's one of my favorite things to do. And when I make it, I cure it up. And if you're not familiar with Tasso, it's like a New Orleans Cajun style ham that's dry cured and then hot smoked. Um, so similar to bacon, but it's got like cinnamon and cayenne, a lot of like hot pepper and stuff in it. It's really delicious. Um, Tasso, T-A-S-S-O. Um, and I can send you a recipe if you want. Um, so when I get it out of cure and rinse the cure off, I stick it in front of a box fan for like an hour and just get it really, really dry before I put it on the smoker. Um, so we're going to say jowl bacon, one and a half. I'm going to draw a name to, for someone to take this. And that way I can put your name on the bag too. Um, and then we'll cure off this bacon. We can give away some of it. Sixteen. Kirk Burnside. Right here. Yay. Right on. You want some jowl bacon. Awesome. Okay. If anybody wants to come up and cure this bacon, feel free. I feel terrible that y'all haven't been more hands on. Come on. Who wants to come? Get a little sticky. If you wanted to, if you wanted, if you were worried about the cure, which I'm not usually worried about with bacon because it's so thin, it cures pretty easily. Go ahead. 
Um, you can take the skin off most of the way, rub all the cure over it, put the skin back on top, let it cure, rinse it off, smoke it with the skin on to hold the moisture and then take the skin off when you're done. That's what I do with when I'm smoking a picnic or something big, is I take the skin most of the way off to get the seasonings and the cure in there really good. Um, Mm -hmm. Just to keep the moisture in, you know. And you're saying that's jowl bacon? This is just belly right here. Yeah. This was okay. the jowl. Okay. Um, um, there you are. You can do all three of those. I'll get you some bags. Mm, where are those bags? So the next thing we'll work on is a wet cure. It's also called a brine. I don't really like to call it brine because that can often be confused with the brining that you do just to flavor or tenderize a piece of meat. Whereas a wet cure is very clear. It's a brine for the purpose of curing the meat. So it's gonna pull the water activity, um, or change the water activity, I guess. It's gonna be pretty saturated. But um, it has a nitrate usually and it has way more salt than a brine that you would do for like a chicken overnight or a turkey before Thanksgiving. Um, so, for example, that's perfect. The head cheese, that was like a tenderizing, gentle brine. It wasn't really a curing brine. It didn't have a nitrate in it. Whereas we're going to make some Canadian bacon and we're going to use a wet brine. And you'll see in the recipe that the salt is much higher um, per gallon of water. It should be at least. Um, and then there's a nitrate included and there's some sweeteners and spices. So the difference, I mean, people often ask me, can you make bacon out of such and such? Or you can make bacon out of anything. You can bacon your entire pig if you want to. You can make shoulder bacon. Canadian bacon is made with the loin, which is back meat. Um, American bacon is made with the belly. Um, but the, the idea for Canadian bacon is that it's leaner because the loin has more lean meat than fat. Um, it's easy to isolate the fat from the rest of the, the lean. So what I did is I bought a whole bone and loin and I did put some of it in my freezer, I will confess, it was huge. So pigs, depending on their breed, have 12 to 16 ribs. So they can get really long loins on them. And this was a very long one. So I took some of it, I took some of the rib off and put it in my freezer for pork chops. And then I boned the rest of it out, the bones went into the stock. And now we have these two boneless pieces of back meat, which we're gonna make into Canadian bacon. So the first thing I have to do is dissolve the salt. So what I've done is I've taken all the salt in your Canadian bacon recipe and I put it in a pot. And I'm just gonna add enough water, and I should probably measure it. I'm just gonna add enough water to dissolve it, probably a gallon or so. And then I can complete the brine by adding cold. You always want your brine to be, or your wet cure to be cool. You don't ever want to piece, put a piece of meat in a hot liquid because then it's going to cook the outside. Um, so I just want to dissolve the salt and then let that cool. And then I'll add cold water to cover the meat inside of it. And so wet, wet cures can be done in a lot of different ways. Sometimes they're injected with a meat syringe. Um, sometimes they're pumped in, there's spray injectors, there's meat pumps, there's all these different tools. And the reason for that is that spraying and injecting allows the meat to pick up more of the, of the cure than just floating it in there. But it's a little bit more sophisticated, so that's why the floating brine is used more often on the home scale. But combination techniques are used. So for example, like a ham could be injected with a wet cure then rolled in a dry cure with a lot of sugar and then left to cure like that and then it could be rinsed and smoked. So you can kind of see all the different applications. So what we'll do is um, mix up this brine. I've got a bucket for it. And we may actually, I might send one of them home with some, somebody so we'll put them in a bag. But you'll similarly just leave it in there about a day a pound flip it over at uh, regular intervals and take it out and smoke it, you'll have Canadian bacon. <coughs> and I think it's important to note that bacon is not necessarily always smoked. It's just cooked. Granted, we associate it with that smoky flavor, but it could still technically be bacon if you baked it in the oven, as long as it's cooked to temperature. 
Good job. Any questions about whole muscle cares as we're waiting for that brawn to develop? Pretty much. I mean, there may be some Canadians who would disagree with me. But um, I did not look up a special, like I just made it, I made it up. If you wanted to use maple syrup instead of, would you rub it on this? Mm -hmm. okay. so maple syrup may be more effective in a wet cure. I don't know. I've done maple, when, when I had my butcher shop, we did wet cure for all of our bacon. So when we did maple bacon, it was just a wet cure anyway. I've never, has anybody done a dry cure with maple? No? Right. Right. But because it, there's no oxygen, it picks it up a lot more readily and easily than if it's floating around in a bucket where there's air and you know it's popping out and there's air on the top and you've got to whatever weight it down. Okay, so I'm um, just like with the jowls, we want to we want to get a weight on this. And I mean, it's not necessarily like crazy to get or crazy necessary to get a weight because, again, you might be hot smoking it and cooking it to temperature. But say you wanted to cold smoke it, it might be good to know what your starting weight was. So this is three two. What am I going to do with this? I'm going to give it away to somebody. Um, I am with one of the jowls. Yeah, and you can feel free to add to this cure when you get home. Maybe what I'll do for these other two is put some garlic in them. Um, that would probably make it better. This is really scientific. So mm -hmm. Get you some garlic in there. Okay, two gallon bags, two gallon bags. All right, I'm giving away two of these and I'm keeping one. I'm supposed to be moving this weekend. My boyfriend will be much happier with me if I have bacon and, and was absent for a whole day of moving than if I have no bacon and was absent for a whole day of moving. Time what? You know, well, I, d I would have rather not done it this weekend, but I have to start traveling a lot after this week, so it's like just got to happen. Yeah, it's supposed to snow, too. It's, like, awesome. <laughs> okay. Donde esta? I'm starting to get lost up here. Any other questions about mus whole muscle cures? So another example of this is going to be prosciutto, which we can jump to in a second. That's, like, just like one chali, it's going to be a dry cure that's then fermented. Um, I said three, two. That's done. Oh. What time is it? Okay. Oh wow, we are doing so good. We're gonna get to make extra sausage and cut up a ham. Um, but you guys are starting to look a little crazy. Do we need to go like run around the building or something? Yeah, okay. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. Do whatever you want. Bake it in the oven. Yeah, super low heat, cook it in the oven, build a smoker, or no, in a box, or you could hang it over your fire, your campfire, you could take the skin off and cure it and then you could roll it up in cheesecloth and hang it like pancetta, you could cut it into strips and cook it a little bit at a time in pasta or, you know, I mean, It'll be cured, so it'll be delicious. 
no matter what you do. Yeah. All we do is win. Um, okay. Re Well, is it electric? No. Okay. They do have electric ones. Yeah. Would it work for bacon? Yeah. Sure, why not? The only thing the water feature is for is just keeping more moisture in the product. So it was, it was basically those were developed by like, um, like chain restaurants that were making ribs like really yeah. fast. Extra. Yeah. But it's a moisture thing, you know. All right, let's, let's give away some bacon. And then you all can go run around the building. OK. And I'll check the head cheese while you're gone. Number four, Tiffany Hooper. Tiffany, yeah. OK, I'm going to write your name on it, because I don't want to forget. Okay. <laughs> I can't read my own handwriting. Eldon. All right. You got bacon. Okay. Okay. All right, y'all, take a break. Move around, stretch yourselves. Oh, would you, are we making y'all sausage later? Yeah, would you kick me that recipe so we can work on uh, portioning out the... What you got? Well, I didn't know if you had red pepper flake. I don't. You know, I'm so bummed that I don't either. But we have cayenne. We can try it with that. Okay. I think you're going to have to add a little more sugar. Okay. Don't you think? Red pepper flake versus cayenne? Yeah, probably so. All right, well, do you want to start weighing out ingredients yeah. or do you want to like go run around the building? Because no, no, if you do, no, that's no, fine. Are those gels? These are not. These are um, funny little pieces that I pulled out of the shoulder. Okay. Like, have you ever heard of a beef? <laughs> have you ever heard of a beef mock tender? No. This is like oh. the pork equivalent. Okay. So I pulled them out because I want to cure them and hang them up and see what happens. Listen, I, am, I feel like I was too embarrassed to even ask this question. Mm -hmm. What is curing? Curing is just salt um, and osmosis pulling it the water activity but down. When you said, cause, because you said, and then you do this, blah, 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 and your meat will be cured. I mm -hmm. mean, when is your meat cured? Um, well, generally after a day per pound for smaller cuts or three days a pound per bone-in larger cuts. Okay, so you're not talking about eating it like that. No, 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 no. You'll almost always do something afterwards, like ferment it, smoke it, cook it. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. I always thought that the smoking meant curing and the fermenting mm -hmm. meant curing. Yeah. It doesn't. Well, I think people just talk, people talk about meat that's gone through a curing step and then a subsequent preparation like smoking, fermenting, or cooking yeah. as a cured meat. Yes. So that's why yes. you think that's that like I'm that's so the confused. finished thing. But okay, yeah. Okay, got it. In general, it's like. It's the salt and the spices in a chilled environment for mm -hmm. so many times before you do what mm -hmm. you need to before you Yeah, kill and you'll be able to tell a physical difference. Like if yes. you put the cure on it and then you like squeeze it after it's done, it'll be hard. It'll be like firm and hard. Yes, that, yeah. that part I know. Yeah. But I mean, not to kill yourself, you, do, you need to do the smoking or right. the fermenting or, or fermenting or something. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a common thing to be confused about. Don't feel bad. And in terms of teaching, 
Um, I was just kind of listening to you. Pate is when you macerate the stuff and then cook it. Mm -hmm. Terrine is when you cook it first and then macerate it. Kind of, yeah, but sometimes the terrine is not necessarily macerated. Like, like I said, it could be like whole asparagus. It's just like oh, okay. suspended food, suspended oh, in, in an the, aspect. In the, okay. Yeah. But in, but the cooking in those two processes are right, and there are opposite. raw pâtés as well. Oh, you know, forget it. Yeah. I don't know anything. <laughs> really, we've got a couple of bread Tamworth gilts right now that we're looking forward to. Having some babies this spring here at the farm. Well, right now they've they've just gotten bread, so we're about to bring them back like next week. Okay. Yay! Participation. I am adding my pre-mixed brown sugar, bay leaf, coriander, juniper, rosemary, and nitrate into this Canadian bacon brine. That's what I'm doing right now. Because remember I already had the salt in there and I just added some cold water. So it's, you know, decently cool. It's not ideal, you know, but we're gonna, we're gonna make it happen. So I've got my boned out loin. I'm gonna stick it in here. And ideally, I would put a weight of some kind in there, maybe a plate that was about that size, but I don't have one, so we're just going to pretend that it's there. That's really pretty, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Maybe some good bacon. Where, why do you have to press the terrines or the pâtés? What happens if you don't press them? Well, they won't be, they won't be compact and solid for slicing. They'll be puffy with air in them. And also, because they, they do expand when they cook, so if I hadn't pressed it and I pulled the top off, it would be like a loaf of bread with like a dome and some air pockets in it. But I mean, traditionally they're served like cold sliced and they're very firm and they're very uniform. So the pressing is that, for that. Um, so we're gonna let this uh, Canadian bacon hang out in this Brian, and there was a participant who was confused about the word curing, so I'll go over it for everybody. Because we think of bacon, salami, and other meats like this that we eat as cured meats, there's a common misconception that once you've stopped this curing step where you're bringing the water activity down and you're letting salt act on the meat, that the meat is done, that that's not true. So once you've finished the curing step, either a wet cure or a dry cure, the meat is going to go on and either be fermented, cooked, or smoked until it's completed, but it is still a cured meat, right, in the marketplace. So that's a common confusion. Another common piece of confusion is loin meat. Everybody thinks the tenderloin is the only loin, but loin refers to any meat that runs along the spine, any back meat. The tenderloin is a different muscle entirely. So the loin muscle runs all the way from the shoulder to the top of the, sp to the, top of the hip, and it's called the longissimus dorsi. It's the longest muscle in the body. The tenderloin is actually nestled up underneath the spinous processes, it's called psoas major. It's a completely different muscle. So that's a little, so if you hear of like a pork loin roast, that's coming from that back meat, that longissimus muscle. If you get a pork tenderloin, that's that psoas major muscle. The lay mignon comes from the psoas, tenderloin muscle. It is the least used muscle on the animal, the tenderest muscle on the animal, and the most tasteless muscle on the animal. And why it is the most valuable muscle on the animal still perplexes me. And I really try to get people away from that. This. We'll go in the fridge now. Um, and what we'll probably do before the end of the day is bag up one of these and send it home with somebody. We can draw that name now, want to? What is this is the Canadian bacon that we're doing. We're basically just, just to show you a wet cure as opposed to a dry cure. Does that, does that mean that Canadian bacon is always wet cured? No, sometimes it's dry cured. I just, I just wanted you to have an example of both. That's the longissimus muscle, so it's, it's, it's coming from the back. So this, there's a portion of this. So there's two, kind of two main sections of that longissimus muscle. There's the rib section and the short loin. Short loin being like your cow's New York strip. The rib section being the prime rib or the rib eyes. Um, bone in pork chops are taken from the rib portion. Usually boneless pork chops are taken from the short loin portion. So it's done by counting ribs. So the rib portion being from rib usually six to the second to last rib. 
and then the short loan being all the meat between the second to last rib and the hip. So if you take a butchery class, then that's more of the stuff that we'll talk about there. Um, who's going to win the Canadian bacon? Number six, Irvin Smith Jr. Oh, you took your name off. Okay, it goes to the next person. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> He's at his table. Do I have to do it? All right, I'll, I'll redraw. We wanted to be fair. Whew. That was exciting, wasn't it? All right, let's see. Um, nine. Russell. Yes. All right. Remember decide. that, because I can't write your name on it yet. How do you decide how many days this cures in being wet? Is it? I'm going to do a day, day per, per pound. pound. Okay. But also, I'll go in and feel it. So when it's done with the curing step, what you want it to feel like is firm. Okay. And you want it to be kind of pink, because that nitrate in there is going to make it like a really pretty deep pink color. The thing about wet brining or wet curing is that it's the, ma the master recipes are a little bit less reliable because the professionals, what they'll do is they'll set the degree of salinity based on how long they want to cure the meat and what type of muscle it is. So in general, the saltier the brine, the faster the cure. So I've just done like a really general brine here for pork. So in the book, I, like I kind of cringe at the master brine recipe um, because different meat likes different salinity. So red meats are going to want a higher salinity and poultry and fish are going to want a lower salinity. So I have a master brine recipe in the book, one for pork and red and lamb and beef and one for poultry and fish. And the way that that is expressed is in degrees salinity and that's measured with a tool called a salometer that is floated in a brine solution and, and where it registers is the degree of the salinity in the brine. So a 75-ish degree brine is really I, kind of a nice middle ground for one day per pound on red meat and a 21 degree brine is a really nice middle ground for one day a pound on chicken or duck or something like that. Um, it's 34 outside, do you want to stick it outside? Yeah, let's do that. We got a Nature. big refrigerator today. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. We're going to make prosciutto. Um, so I built, I'm really excited about this yeah. because I've had this leg forever. And I just bought this 55-pound bag of Himalayan sea salt. Oh, my gosh. And I just made this box yeah. in the office yesterday while I was listening to All Them Witches, which is a really good band. So what I did was I just took these two apple crates and I pulled the sides off of them. They look like this. Mm -hmm. And I had this big wrecking bar. Like I came from the shed with this wrecking bar that was like this big, past like all the little school children. <laughs> and I was like, we're gonna end this once and for all. Like I'm making all these jokes and stuff. Anyways, went into the office, pulled it apart, and then I took two of these and I just put them together and then I covered it with screen. And I haven't had time to make a top yet, so we're going to fudge it a little bit, and I'm going to take it home to my new house and figure it out. So basically a prosciutto, traditional prosciutto, is a dry cured bone-in ham. And the ham is the back, the, the rectus muscles, right, the gluteus muscles, and the, and the leg. Um, so I have one. It's about 40 pounds. We'll bring it out. What I did was, it's basically, it's salt cured, so it's usually salt and a nitrate, and it stays in there three days per pound at the most. So it'll be in cure for quite a while. Ideally, I would have liked to start this earlier in the winter so that I could keep it outside. Um, I may have to steal some space in the walk-in for this. Um, so once it comes out of that salt, then it will be rinsed just like any other cure, and then traditionally, any part where bone is exposed, you will um, pack rendered lard on those spots, and then you will put cracked black pepper over the top of that, wrap it in cheesecloth, and hang it up, and let it dry, either in a charcuterie cabinet. I've made them in my closet before. You can hang them as long as you want, and until it's lost 30 to 40 percent of its weight. It could be 18 months. It could be two years. It could be one year, depending on the size. I've wrapped it in a pillowcase before, too. It worked really well. What's that? It's pretty.
pretty much it's it's pretty much drying it, yeah. But it's, I mean, there's undoubtedly a little bit of fermentation going on in there, at least at first. And we'll talk about how those reactions happen so that will be more clear, because our next section is fermented, pro fermented sausages, which is when we get into all that detail. Pat, would you like to unwrap this sure. for me? And I will, so what I've done is, when I mix out, because I'm a very good charcuterer, I mix out my cure number two and I labeled it nitrate so that no one would think it was table salt because it's white and scary like that. Um, and in a general sense, what do you use one versus two? So one is your readily available fast curing nitrite. So that's what you use for cures that don't take as long. Or if you, if you were the type of person to use a nitrite just for coloring, you would use cure number one. Cure number two is what you use for fermented or long dried products like prosciutto. And what determines fast versus long? Basically, the size. So it takes longer to cure a huge leg, you know. But also, I mean, if I'm going to, anytime I'm going to ferment something in general and hang it up, I'm using cure number two in general. Now, I have left it out of brazole, beef brazole. I've left it out of, of a cured pancetta. I've left it out of guanciale. I even fed the pancetta to Gret, and he's still here. Who knows, right? <laughs> that was awesome. We are getting friendly here. All right, so what I'll probably do is um, I only have this much nitrate to put on the prosciutto, but I ha I'm going to bury it in salt. But I don't want to get into the situation where I'm mixing all that salt with the nitrate. So probably what I'm going to do is get a sheet pan, and I'm just going to put this on it with enough salt, and then I'm going to roll the leg in it and then drop it in the box and then cover it, right? So my nitrate's got contact with the leg and then the rest of it's just salt, buried in salt so that it starts drawing out that. So how I will use this box is I'll probably fashion something to go under it yeah. so that as it leaches, it's water. Awesome, let's get a sheet pan. Yeah. Thank you. It will go through the screen somewhat, but my thinking is that because it will be sitting on the ground or on this pan or some other pan, there's only so much salt that's going to leak through, you know? In general, as the product leaches and as the salt gets a little bit wet and it starts to shrink, you're going to have to add more salt throughout the curing process anyway. You want to make sure the leg is completely buried all the time. So I'm going to lose some salt here and there. And this is a this is a pork leg. And is prosciutto always pork? You can make lamb, goat, prosciutto. I have some lamb prosciutto I'm going to feed you guys. It'll knock your socks off. It's like really salty and really lamby. So it's going to be really different from the prosciutto that you're used to eating. But I basically took um, a leg of lamb, but I boned it out so it didn't have the bone in it. And I did 2.5% uh, um, salt. I think, and then I did some pepper and I put some nitrate in it and I cured it and then I wrapped it in cheesecloth and hung it under my kitchen cabinet. <coughs> and it cured in like two weeks because it was so small. So you know? Mir, the prosciutto that you're talking about doing, um, putting so much salt in it and that type of thing, that sounds very similar to corning something. It does, yeah. Corning is traditionally a wet brine, if I'm not mistaken. But it is basically the same thing. A corned beef is a cured product. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking more of a corning in terms of pork. Uh -huh. I've seen that as a dry. Oh, have you? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's well, a general of the same thing because okay. corning is like curing. Okay. It's like pick, you know, pickling or curing. Okay. Yeah. So That's just like a more probably traditional or way of expressing it, uh, okay. I think, you know? Yeah, because you, I mean, there, there used to be a time where you could actually go to the store and buy the products that were poor. Yeah. You know, where, you know you, and, and people would um, actually buy, say, a fresh shoulder. Yeah. And if they wanted to have it for a holiday, they would just take it home and wash it. Yeah. 
wash it and dry it and just rub salt all over So they were dry? They were dry curing it. Uh -huh. Interesting. And wrap it up and they stick it in the fridge. My dad used to, a long time ago, he used to take his meat, his mm -hmm. pork, and, and he would um, put it in salt yep. and put it in wooden crates. Yeah, that's exactly and, the same and thing. Let it, you know, and then you were flying salt. Exactly the same yeah. thing. You got it. He was making pancetta. He was making kind of. Um, and so like to make corned beef, that's what you do is you, you basically make a brine. It's usually wet brine, wet cured. You make a brine and then it's boiled after it's cured. If you want to make pastrami, it's generally the same brine and then you smoke it with some black pepper on the outside of it for pastrami. Some people that are very famous for their pastrami will corn it, brine it, uh -huh. rinse it, boil it, wrap it, and then smoke it. So they get all of those things. And I mean, I'm, I'm still struggling with that process. They must be cold smoking it. But I met a guy who was hot smoking it. I'm like, how is it not overcooked if you boil it and then hot smoke it? But it was delicious. I mean, I had it at a wedding, and I was like, I need to meet this man. And I went over and talked to him, and he told me his process, boiled it just like corned beef, and then hot smoked it like pastrami. All right, so what we should do, Greg, is dump. I'm going to hold this. Will you dump some salt into the pan? Well, you're not going to use the other stuff. I am. I'm going to mix them together. Okay. Um, just a cup. A cup. I just want to get enough salt on the bottom of this pan so that I can mix the nitrate into it. I don't want the straight nitrate just slapping on the meat. I want it mixed with, okay. with the sea salt. Tell us when we get enough salt on the pan. Just layer it up there. Where did you get that 50 pounds? Enough? Oh, no, more. More? Yeah, fill up the whole pan. Um, I got it from um, Hal, what is Hal's last name? No, Hal and Asha. I don't know Hal's last name. Hal and Asha. Asha works here at this school and Hal buys in like huge pallets of this sea salt and sells it for a hundred bucks a bag. So that was a hundred bucks for 55 pounds, which is a pretty good price. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I don't know Hal's direct con. I might get in trouble for this, okay. but no, no, no. I'll give it. No, I, here's the thing. I know Hal wants to sell it. I just don't know if his wife wants to be in between. But I have her email address if you want to. Love for him to get rid of it. Okay. Her email address is Laurel, L A U R E L, Moral like the mushroom, M O R E L at gmail.com, and her name is Asha, but it's spelled like Asia. And her husband's name is Hal, and just tell him you want to buy some salt, and tell him that Meredith sent you. Maybe I'll get an even bigger discount next time. Buy it sooner or later, the price goes up the longer, the less he has. I don't think he's going to keep doing it. I think he did it once. No, he's going to keep doing it. He oh, told yeah. me that he's gotten to where Hoppy and Company will buy a whole pallet from him. Uh -huh. okay. So he buys two pallets at a time and sells one to them, and then retails the rest to people. Uh -huh. Yeah, it used to be, a, well, maybe it's Hopi, I don't know how to say it. It used to be amazing saving. So I'm just rubbing this. Oh, I'm so excited. So how much does that weigh there, this uh, piece of meat? What's that? How much does this meat weigh? This weighs, I think, about 40 pounds. I was using a broken scale. <laughs> so I don't know. I do my thing. I'm not really sure. I mean, I do my thing by like, is this the bag of chicken feed? <laughs> right. It's not as heavy as that bag of salt. Right. Not quite. I'm like, you know, like my three-year-old weighs like 25, 30 pounds. So I've got that like down pretty pat, you know. Okay, so now what we want to do is dump the salt that, oh, no, we need something under that crate. Yeah, that's what we that crate's not going to fit on this, is it? Uh, I don't think so. It looks a little too... Okay. Well, I might, just, I might just double up. For now, I might just double up sheet pans and then deal with it later. How about this? Is bigger? No, I don't think it is. What are you talking about? I've learned to put that in the coffee grinder so I can use it to bake it. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful salt. Look at it. Did you guys look at it? Let's make a little bit of a mess. Whose coat is that? Oh, paper. Somebody was making paper on that. All right. Does 
that, a, is that an issue for you? I don't care. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to lift it up again. Okay, so you're going to put all the salt in here? Not all of it, just some of it. Just like some on the bottom. I'm thinking once we get a decent amount of salt in there, it's going to stop just falling through the screen. Yeah, don't you probably. think? Gred is my inventor friend who doubts all of my uh, DIY projects. <laughs> you want a bed of salt in here? Yeah, that's good. Let's, here's hoping the leg fits in there. <laughs> You know what, I went to, um, and then we can just pour the rest of it on top. I went to the Habitat store. I'm always like on the lookout for ham boxes and stuff. My boyfriend called me one day and he was like, I found a ham box, $25, you have to get a Habitat now. I'm like, okay. So I'm driving over there and he's been standing there with it for an hour. And we, I get there, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's perfect. Let's get it. And this woman was like, I already got it. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> She's like, yeah, I just pulled the green tag off of it while you weren't looking. I was like, oh. And he was like, I've been here for an hour. And she was like, sorry, that's how it works. So Hence my covered. building this on Friday. It's supposed wow. to be totally covered in salt. Yeah. And I might, you know, like fill in with kosher salt, you know, if I don't have enough of this. This is okay. I feel good about it. So good luck getting this out of here, right? All right. I don't think we're using it. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this head out and get it cooling so that somebody, some people can start picking it soon. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. This is just traditional, you know which I'm pretty excited about. I think I said that a few times. <laughs> this is your two year anniversary. This should help. There you go. It won't bend, hopefully. Oh, that's just torn too. You got it? Great. Okay, the head is done. So we know it's done because the jaw is moving? Well, the jaw is kind of moving, but what I did was just start pulling the meat off the bone. Look how easily it comes off. That jaw is loose, you see that? It's so fascinating. If you look at the palate, the top. Cool, if you want to look at it. Um, one of our heads to a friend of a head sheep, and she said the most difficult part was getting the hair off. Yeah, well, there's a few hairs on there. Don't put that in the loaf pan, y'all. Oh, it definitely tastes good. Just got to put enough salt on it. This year, we went to a friend, and what they did is they carved the meat off the bone, off the head. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, it's tet presse, so it's a rolled pressed head. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's fun to do. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about fermented sausages. Everybody ready? What's up? Oh yeah, because it's a head. Nice. Very good. I'm gonna. How long it sits in there and how long it. I'm going to think I'm going to cure it for three days per pound. So okay. it's uh, 40 pounds, roughly. Do the math. Mm -hmm. um, Four months. So, yeah, it'll be in there for well past winter being over, which means that I'm probably going to need to put it somewhere cold, like in a walk-in cooler okay. somewhere. And then once it is done with that curing step, I'll rinse it off, dry it as well as I can. And then that top part that's exposed, mm -hmm. like the exposed femur bone and the exposed meat, I will put rendered lard on it. This is the traditional way. And then put cracked back black pepper on top of the lard. And that's like sealing the exposed bone, sealing the exposed, because really what, what bone does, I mean, granted it'll be cured at that point, but if you have a fresh piece of meat with bone in it, it will turn faster than a piece of meat without bone in it. So. Any exposed bone, any exposed meat needs to be sealed just 
is as even as the part of the meat that's sealed by the skin currently, right? So we use the lard to do that. The black pepper is kind of an old-timey way of keeping insects away. And then you, ro you wrap it in cheesecloth or like a pillowcase. And then because I left the trotter on, I can hang it from its Achilles tendon up, you know, in my charcuterie cabinet or somewhere and let it dry until it's lost 30% of its weight. Okay, and that's just, you like check it once? Just check it, have a good scale. And I mean, we've done them before where we didn't weigh them, you know, and we just like tried to tell, you know. And you could even like, I, I think one time we had one and we like started cutting into it. We're like, oh, it's done, it's done. And then we're like, oh, it's not really done. <laughs> so we like, we like ate some of the stuff on the outside and then we just wrapped it back up and let it hang more, you know? And it was a little bit flexy like that. How much uh, money are you going to have invested in that? Like, salt? Well, I got that pig for free. Um, How many if you had to buy it? The, the leg? The meat, yeah. Well, it just depends on... I mean, you might be able to get bigger portions like that at cost, which may be like $3 a pound, you know? So what is that? 120 bucks, you know? And then you salt it. But say you use coaster salt, which is way cheaper, you know? Or you go buy a real salt at the co-op in bulk, you know, and you get it for less than $100 a bag, you know? Then, you know, 150 bucks. It's a lot of meat. It's a lot of meat. A lot of times when people cure prosciutto at home, they're like, what, now it's done, and what am I going to do with it all? Yeah. Just like, you make friends. You give it away. You vacuum seal it. You put it in the cooler. You sell it. Yeah. You trade it for, like, I, many of my most prized possessions I have traded for charcuterie. Because people are like, oh, yeah, bring it on, you know, when you have, when you have that. All right. Yeah. When I was growing up, they used to have, they had the table, and they packed salt on the meat. Yeah. Yeah, freezing is like, I mean, there were some butchers that would tell you freezing, like never freeze a piece of charcuterie, but that's like a purist sort of way of thinking well, about it. All my neighbors and yeah, put it on the shed. But I think that they want it to be cold, right? They're doing yeah. it in the wintertime because yeah, they don't want parasites. They don't want, you know, um, that piece of meat has already been frozen for a really long time. I mean, I, ha I didn't, wasn't ready for it. I was doing other projects, you know. Also, the trichina parasite in pastured pork or in deer and I mean, it's not in every pig or deer, but it's a worry for people with um, outdoor animals. The way to ensure that you won't have the trichina parasite in your meat is to freeze it for 20 days or more below 10 degrees. So when you hear somebody buying certified pork, that's what they're buying is pork that's been frozen so that the trichina is not an issue. Um, so that's a risk, I guess. If you have a pastured hog and you never freeze it and then you cure it and you never cook it, then trichina is something to think about. It's not likely that you'll get a parasite from it, but that's something that, you know, we teach. Um, is that that's one of the dangers? To lose 30% of the weight, it's got to be cold, right? I mean, Well, cold? okay, we're about to talk about fermentation, so this is a great segue. You guys are, you're starving for it. Look at you. Um, okay, we're not going to give that away. We don't need to draw any names right now. Um, Uh, so let's talk about fermentation. Wow, where do I start? So, a salami, a prosciutto, there's another, um, like, to an extent guanciale, but not so much. Um, any meats that are, that skip the cooking step and after the curing step are just hung to dry, then that is essentially considered a fermented product, either a whole muscle or a ground product like a sausage. And ground Fermented meats are considered the most difficult form of charcuterie because there's just a lot of different factors at play. Um, and so, go back to your PowerPointy looking handout, and there is um, on the back page it just kind of talks about some of the basic fundamentals of fermented meats. Um, fermentation is a is a biological process that is completed by bacteria. We're all familiar with this, right? Has anyone made sauerkraut? So it's the same, that fermentation is happening due to the same genuses of bacteria as what's happening in a vegetable ferment. It's lactobacillus and uh, P. 
Pediococcus, I believe, are two genuses that are chiefly responsible for fermentation. And what happens in fermentation is that bacteria consume sugars, complex sugars such as carbohydrates or simple sugars such as glucose, it doesn't matter. And then by metabolizing those sugars, they then turn them into lactic acids and alcohols, which is what produces the sourly flavor that we associate with fermented products. All of that happens at higher temperatures. So the higher the temperature, the faster those microbes work. The more sweeteners they have, the more they have to eat, the more fermentation they can do. Um, and then once that process, not necessarily once it's over, it's not like discrete and abrupt. So those two genuses of bacteria will do that fermentation process. When, when they convert those sugars and carbohydrates into acids and alcohols, the pH, right, of that product will drop. It will become more acidic. Um, and once that happens and they run out of sugar to eat, they will slowly start to die and other bacteria will take over. And what those bacteria are responsible for is the further curing, the flavoring, the aging of the meat. So essentially when you talk about fermented cured products, you're talking about a two-step process, a fermentation process and a drying further curing process. So um, it's fascinating. I mean, we think about like, we don't really know what's going on inside of a ground fermented sausage or even a whole muscle. It's, it's something, it's a process where we have to pretty much surrender in the most traditional sense to nature to do that process for us. And when you buy a salami from the store, that's been mass produced, you're not really getting a product that has depended on those processes. So, you know, let's, a perfect example is the World, he World Health Organization's most recent proclamation that cured meats will give you cancer and red meats will most likely give you cancer. And a lot of that is fear tactics and it is based on, first of all, it was a meta-analysis, so it wasn't looking at a specific study where we fed so-and-so cured meats and so-and-so got cancer and so-and-so died. It's like we looked at people who are parts of different studies. Maybe this one was about diet. Maybe this one was about heart disease. Maybe this one was about cancer. And then we looked at what they were eating, and then we tried to come to some conclusion about what cured, the role that cured meats played in that process. So that's already a little bit less reliable than a study. But the other thing that wasn't mentioned was what were all the other things that were put into those cured meat products that were tested? And so this is something that's really important for people who are learning charcuterie. You can accomplish a fermented product without all the crazy additives, the crazy acidifiers, the different sweeteners. Very, very traditional fermented products could be as simple as salt, a little bit of sweetener, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of black pepper, and a tiny bit of nitrate, and that's it. And so that's the type of curing that I teach. That's the type of fermentation that I teach. I'm not interested. I have in the past used vitamin C and citric acid and GDL and all the sodium erythrobrate and all those things that you use for color or binding or whatever, but we don't need all that. Those are all additives, right? Um, and depending on what they are, a perfect example is something that we're going to be using today, dextrose. Dextrose is corn sugar. It's straight glucose. So if you don't buy it organic, it is most certainly coming from genetically modified corn. So when we look at sal most salamis that are mass produced, use dextrose because it is a very fine grain, very, very sweet product that the bacteria can act on quickly and they love to eat it, right? So if I am producing massive quantities of salami for the market and I don't have time to let them all cure for months and months, what I need is a really fast fermentation reaction and then I need to counteract the super sour flavor that I'm going to get from that really fast reaction with a whole bunch of sugar and flavorings. So that's what's going into those grocery store salamis. Secondly, that's those second two groups of bacteria, the Coceria and the Staphylococcus, it's a beneficial form of staph, they will only do their work slowly. They will only come on after the fermentation process has brought the pH to a certain level. So in a mass-produced sausage, you may not even get that step at all. So you will, and those are the two bacteria that are chiefly responsible for flavoring the product. So you will never, ever, ever get the flavor from a mass-produced salami that you will get that you can make at home, you know? And you will always, almost always see complex and sketchy additives in those products. So this is a great reason for making your own stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, so knowing that, we, we can kind of see like, 
Okay, so in a sausage, in a fermented sausage, we're basically going to be putting it in an environment that, that um, encourages the growth of bacteria. <laughs> um, we are going to be putting it in an anaerobic environment, um, sucked into a bunch of meat and fat and put inside a casing. So while that's happening, we're also creating a breeding ground for botulism. We're creating a breeding ground for bad staff. We're creating a breeding ground. So what do we do? The process for, for producing these products, yeah, we're going to depend on that bacteria, but we're also going to use tools to make sure that we are, be, we are benefiting the good bacteria and we're excluding the bad bacteria. So as a result, fermented products almost always have a higher salt content than other cured meats. They'll have up to three, sometimes three and a half percent salt. And what that's doing is it is bringing the salt content to an environment that's inhospitable to the, to the bad bacteria without creating an overly salty eating experience. So that's a, that's a good balance, three to three and a half. The salami that we're gonna make today has the 3% salt content, if you do the math in the, in the recipe. Um, we use starter cultures sometimes when we're doing fermented products. We'll use one today, which I might need to go grab out of the freezer. Um, and what that does, it's not totally necessary. There's a recipe in the book for a dry sausage that does not use a starter culture. So you can see how easy it is to make one without it. But what the starter culture does is it ensures that you get those good fermenting bacteria in there. So you're inoculating the product with the good guys. You know they're there. And the good news is that all the good guys can survive in a greater temperature range, a greater pH range, and in a higher salt con content than all the bad guys. So it is quite, if you know the rules and you know the ratios and you know what you're working with, it is quite easy to create a safe product at home. Um, the other thing we work with in order to control that environment to the best of our ability is temperature and humidity. And so we're gonna tool through as much as we can, wiring your own charcuterie cabinet with a refrigerator the ideal temperature is going to vary based on product. And if you look at some of the more advanced recipes, you'll see, oh, I'm making a Lomo or a dry cured fermented pork loin. And they want me to ferment it at this temperature. They want me to dry it at this temperature. But really, if you get about 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit and about 65 to 75% humidity, you can cure whole muscles, sausages, whatever. So that's what we're going to do. And Greg is going to take us through that process. There's also a handout. 50 to, 50 to 60 degrees and 65 to 75 percent humidity. Um, so Greg's going to take us through making that conversion. There's also a handout which is printed from the book, one of the sidebars in the book about two controllers you can buy off Amazon and you can wire them to a refrigerator and wire one to a humidifier and put them in a standard fridge and you can create this environment. Um, two things to remember, light causes fat to turn rancid. So if you are curing something for a long period of time, you want to exclude light as much as possible. I had a guy in one of my classes that was having so much trouble, so much trouble, so much trouble, and we finally figured out that he was using a lamp to heat his charcuterie cabinet in the garage. Wow. And so he was getting rancid fats. And that's why his projects weren't working out. So that's something that's really important to remember. The other thing to remember is that the meat itself has more moisture at the beginning of the process. So the humidity is going to be higher at the beginning of the process. And your cabinet as a whole is going to be more humid when the sausage is still moist, like you've just made it. As that sausage water activity drops, everything tends to dry and shrink. Then the humidity is going to naturally go down. What I do is I keep, interestingly, I just started doing this last year with this other, uh, most of the time I was like carrying in my closet, carrying in my kitchen, but I wanted to do more advanced stuff. And so I just started using the refrigerator modification last year. And I have found that I'm mostly trying to keep humidity down in our climate, that I rarely have to use my humidifier attachment. Sometimes I can just put a bowl of water in the bottom if I want the humidity to go up a little bit. But I'm using fans and stuff. In this. If I'm curing the summertime, I use fans to try to keep humidity down. But I set it at that baseline that I gave you. When I put the sausage in, then that humidity automatically goes up. And that's OK, because during fermentation, it's OK to have higher temperatures and it's OK to have higher humidity. And then when you really want those steady, steady temperatures that I mentioned is when you're in the drying process, that second sort of curing, flavoring, long-term process. Um, Fermenting is approximately how long? 
Um, it would depend on what you're doing, and it would depend on how much sweetener you used, but it's a shorter process for sure. It's like a week or two. Like I just, and you'll, no, you'll kind of notice like a difference. So in general, the first time people do this, they call me and they're like, it's really kind of gross. Like it's kind of gross in there. It's kind of hot and it's kind of wet and it's kind of, and I'm like, yep, you're fermenting. <laughs> you're fermenting. And then uh, just wait. Just wait, you know? And then sure enough, it's like things change. You know, things dry, things smell different, you know? It's a very sensory process and you have to trust your senses. Like when I'm carrying something under my kitchen cabinet and I don't know exactly what humidity it is, I have to put it in my face and take a day bowl drink every single day. Like how does this smell? Squeeze it, does it feel rotten in the center and dry on the outside? Well, then you know you don't have enough humidity. So these are some of the troubleshooting things that you can do. If you don't have enough humidity, the reason that's crucial is because the outside of the product will start to dry and then it will harden and the inside will just rot because it's not getting the right moisture. And that's called, that forms what's called a gray ring. If you've ever seen like something cut open and cross cut and it's like gray on the outside and mushy on the inside. So that's why you want the higher humidities Right? So that's why I do it in my kitchen if I don't have a cabinet because I've got the water from the washing the dishes and the boiling water from cooking and I know I've got a generally higher humidity in my kitchen than in other rooms. The house that I've been living in is also north facing which is really nice for curing meats because it doesn't get like the beating sun in it. Um, but I'm, I'm a freak and I like keep my heat at the right place for charcuterie rather than the people. Yeah. Quick question. At the risk of uh, trying to maintain a happy marriage, I'm pretty sure I've not been used to kitchen in the closet and what that means. Uh -huh. I mean, <laughs> you'd have to like hook the cord back up, I guess, if you wanted to take it apart. Well, but I mean, you talk about using it as, as your current refrigerator, the conditions are different. Yeah, the conditions are different. You would want a different refrigerator. So um, this one was one that was cycled out of Pat's house, so it's essentially free to us. Um, and these temperature and humidity controllers are what, like 25 bucks a piece? Yeah, well, the other ones that uh, are referred to here, Where's that other one, by the way, that other chamber? That it's at my house. house. So the first one we made, you know, we used the ones that Curtis listed here. This time I went to buy one and I got a different kind. I got one that controls both temperature and humidity in one unit. Um, it is smaller. I thought the easier to hook up. So it's my turn now? Yeah, go. Okay. Um, I'd say the worst part about this is that came from China. I've got it three weeks. I mean, that's good. But the instructions are written in, <laughs> by somebody who's not a native English speaker. So it's, you got to pour over it in time. Um, but this has a connection. This came with one sensor to sense its temperature and humidity. So that makes it more convenient, too, because the other one had two different. Mm -hmm. um, and I just bought a junction box that flows. I bought a couple of extension cords. The cheapest way to get the wiring is just buy some extension cords and cut them off. Can you, Why sir, can you bring it out here in front where we can see it over here? Yeah. Do you want to go back there? There we go. Um, okay, so here is the controller. So that comes with the controller that you that bought. The sensor comes with the controller. Right? Mm -hmm. So what was the cost of the controller? Oh, about 30 bucks or something. That's off Amazon? I'm not sure it was Amazon, but I found it online. Yeah. Um, what yeah. am I looking for? What's it called? Temperature and humidity controller. There are the names of there are the names of two specific models in that handout that you got. You can search for those specifically, and we did get them on Amazon. If you want to be more specific. This one here has no brand name. It's, it's a TH20, whatever that's worth. You know that. I mean, they make these things. Those other ones that I use, so the other one, a bunch of people selling. A bunch of people selling. And this one too. Importers from China. 
So um, this one's may have a slight disadvantage because I don't think you can program it to Fahrenheit. So you got to get used to Celsius. Oh, that mine's like that too. I think yours better when you I think you can switch. Can you? I think. Well, it's got. I've gotten really good at the conversion. Yeah, it's good to know Celsius. I mean, the whole rest of the world is <laughs> yeah. in Celsius. Um, I teach my students if you know several temperatures, you can figure out pretty good. You know, zero, right, is freezing, and 100 degrees is boiling, right? Body temperature, 37. Room temperature, 69 degrees is 20. So use those ballparks, and you can get a pretty good idea of what the Celsius range is. Not another quick way to convert that is to double the Celsius and add 32. That'll get your ballpark. It's not exact. But it's it'll actually nine. Nine fifths, I think. Mm -hmm. Not double, it's nine fifths. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Five fifths. Because there's 180 degrees between boiling and freezing in Fahrenheit and 100 in Celsius, so it's pretty sure it's nine fifths. Um, so, yeah, put these cords in here. It's, you can use various, you can use clamps or something. I just drilled holes at about the right size and I put in things for strain relief. These are a cable clamp that it's pretty good on this and it won't pull off, so the cords won't pull out of the box. Um, you can put knots on the small cords so they don't pull out, because you want to have some kind of thing that doesn't keep them in there. So, I don't know, the rest of this is hooking this up, which y'all can help me if you want. Little screwdriver, there's a little wiring diagram in here. There's two for the power coming in and Remember to set on that little handout there, there's the black is usually the hot, the white is the other hot or neutral, and the green is the ground. This is the <coughs> on the ground connection on it. But the refrigerator might, so the power from the refrigerator just pass through here, and I'll just put a wire nut on the two ground wires so the refrigerator will stay grounded. That's important. The ground is what keeps you from getting shocked if you touch it and there's a loose electricity. So if you're coming at this where I was when I first started, I didn't know that. And I didn't know that like if you look at a cord and it has three prongs, that, mean it's, that means it's a grounded. So the fridge, if it has three prongs, it means it's already grounded, which is good. If it doesn't have that third prong, then you probably need to wire it into another one, right? So that you can ground the fridge and yeah, then. Yeah, the humidifier only has a two prong plug probably. Yeah. Right, so I got a, just a regular. But yeah. humidifiers usually don't have a ground, right? Right, like that's, a yeah. lot of things don't have a ground anymore. A lot of things are double insulated. The refrigerator might not have a ground either, I don't know. It may have a small one. So I just got a lamp cord for the humidifier. You even have a cord? <laughs> so can I ask you a quick question? I got the electrical part, I think I understand it. So the object of the exercise is you got an it's old refrigerator, you got some racks in it, you've got a sensor from that thing that is measuring the humidity and the temperature inside the refrigerator. Is that right? right? And based on what's happening there, you've got a humidifier inside the refrigerator too? Right. Okay. So it's either turning the refrigerator the humidifier on or off, depending on the required humidity. And it's turning the refrigerator on and off? Yes. It's turning the refrigerator on because I mean, when we first did this, we thought we might need to warm it up, right? We had a heater, I think, in our original plan, but the, the te temperature tends to rise mm -hmm. and you got to cool it. So, okay. just, we just so is the refrigerator actually turning on and off or is it just the temperature in the refrigerator is going up and down? The it's turning on and off a bit. Because this will is actually switch to the refrigerator. I mean, your refrigerator is doing that anyway, in general, right? Turning the compressor is turning on and off, off maybe We're differently. Just, this is just another, an override. So you're just tricking. You're just tricking the refrigerator's thermostat, basically. Uh, just, just overriding it. So overriding it. The refrigerator is cold, and this will actually run it. Okay. Yeah, right Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, again, close up. There is wiring diagram in here. This are two sensors in this one cord with four connections. And then two for the hot and what it calls alarm, but it's really a switching circuit in here. There's two of them, one for temperature, one for humidity. And if you're buying one of these things, make sure that you have one that the 
see-through current is enough to run a refrigerator. This is 10 amps, which is adequate for a fridge. But some of them are very low power and are meant for more electronic switching. Um, so just make sure it's probably 10 amps or better that will switch through here. There are micro little, little relays in here that actually switch the current. So I don't know what to go on from here. I mean, I well, I think what we should do is make some salami, and then if um, I'll, I'll wire this up and y'all can see it after before pack it back in the box. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, or if you want to wait and people want to like, I'm, I, I have a feeling we're going to be able to make a salami together as a group, and then we can break out. And if some people want to work on the head cheese, and some people want to make the brat that we voted on, and some people want to work on wiring, then we can do that too while we're getting the food ready. So that way you guys get a little bit more hands-on. Um, yeah, so we'll do that. So let's just do some salami really fast. And I would love to get some people up here to help me if you would like to do that. That would be great. Do we have any grinder parts in the fridge right now? Yes, mine are. OK. So when you make salami, like I said, this is a recipe that kind of shows you all the different, it's going to showcase all the tools we have for encouraging the beneficial bacteria. So we're going to be using a starter culture, 3% salt. We're going to be using nitrate. Um, so you can kind of see an example of all those things. This is a fennel and nutmeg salami. It's really delicious. I, I might get you, Pat, to run downstairs and grab in the freezer, there's a manila envelope with my name on it, and it has the starter culture and the beneficial mold culture in it. Um, so in just general rules, they're following basically the same rules as sausage making. So we want to keep it cold, blah, blah, blah. There's a bit of different ratios. Usually salamis are a bit leaner than fresh sausages. So this is an 80-20 lean to fat. Um, again, it has higher salt content. And what I've done is I've varied, so there's this thing called sausage art that I'm really into. <laughs> and so that's like where you vary your grind and you vary like the way things are. Sometimes people hand stuff their salami so they can affect basically the cross section. So when you cut open a, a cured sausage, the mosaic that you're presented with is like the art, right? So what I've done here is I have the lean meat, which is here which I think we will grind through the fine plate. And then we have this little bit of fat that I'd like to grind through the coarse plate. And then I have some fat that I've cubed that I want to not run through the grinder at all, that I just want to put into the sausage. So we'll get a different, you know, different textures. We'll get, you know, an interesting little mosaic. Um, so in general, you want to mix in all the sweeteners and spices, omitting the salt and nitrate. So you're going to mix all those, grind it, and then at the end, you'll add your salt and nitrate. And the reason for that is so that you don't get funny reactions between the nitrate and any other ingredients that you're using. So if you were using an acidifier like citric acid, sometimes you can get funny reactions with the nitrates and the acidifiers. So we just, as good practice, add the nitrate last. Um, so are you putting that together? Good on you, man. Let's do let's do the lean meat first. Um, fine, fine, yeah. Um, fine plate. Oh, I don't know. Maybe we won't do the fine plate. I guess it's not that important. We can just we can use the coarse plate, Joe, and just run it through twice. Oh man, maybe it got. Did I? I know I put I put some stuff over here. Yeah, we've just been so busy. I've lost everything. All right, Joe, let's just run it through twice. Cause I, oh no no here it is. Ding ding. That'll be faster. Um. Yeah, like what I might do is. Um, Put all the sweeten sweeteners and spices on the lean mat, lean the lean mat, the lean meat, and then put maybe put the salt and the nitrate into the fat. So I might grind this with the coarse plate, 
mix it with this, and then put the salt and nitrate into that, and then mix the two together. You know what I mean? Um, and of course, you don't have to make it that complicated if you don't want to, but it's just good practice. Um, so yeah, we'll start grinding this. Um, I'll mix this in. So I mentioned a couple of other like harmful bacteria that we worry about besides botulism. So botulism is, is of course the big dog, like that's the one we worry about. But the others are staph and listeria. Listeria is, it lives in the animal. Um, and so if you have it, it's something that happened at slaughter or it's something that happened at the processing facility. Most of the time processing facilities are really strict about their cleaning um, and listeria is pretty rare in that way. Um, but if you're killing your own animals, then you need to definitely be as sanitary as you possibly can about it, i.e. not rubbing feces on the inside of the carcass, et cetera. Um, staph is generally, um, it's an aerobic, or it can be facultative aerobic, so it can sometimes live and thrive in anaerobic environments, which is in the absence of oxygen, in case you don't know that term. But staph usually comes from a dirty process. So if your hands are dirty, if your surfaces are dirty, if your meat's too warm, that's when you'll get staff on charcuterie. But it's pretty rare. I mean, if you're doing best practices. So what you mix this is all on the recipe in the handout. This is all the sweeteners, spices, and red wine. Um, and it's mixed onto the, thank you. Oh, and I'll put the starter culture in this um, too. So what I'm using right now is, uh, it's called a TSPX starter culture. It's in your um, handout. This is the starter culture that's used most in traditional long-term cures. You can buy um, other types of starter cultures and some others are recommended, but this one doesn't have any bacteria sides in it. That's why I like it. So there are some that have like beneficial bacteria, but then it also has like a, some chemical thing that will like harm other bacteria, and I'm like, well, we don't need chemical things, right? We just want, like, maybe. So we want free, just freeze-dried starter culture, and that's why I like the TSPX. It works a little bit slower than, you know, so if you were mass-producing something, maybe you wouldn't use it. And a lot of places will say you need the entire packet per recipe, and that's just a bunch of nonsense. You really only need a little bit. So I'm going to put in, and I don't have my measures, but I think your, your recipe says, like, 0.1. So that's about a half a tablespoon. I'm just going to, or half a teaspoon, excuse me. I'm going to mix that in. And then you want to, you can save this, right? So this is like 15 bucks. I'm not going to dump it all in one sausage. So I save this, put it back in the freezer, and I can use it, you know, whenever I'm making a product. I got this from, um, gosh, where did I get this from? Oh, I got it at sausagemaker.com. I was going to say Butcher Packer, and I'm like, no, no, I did not get that at Butcher Packer. All right, so we've got our starter culture in here. Would you mind grinding this? And I'm going to wash some beef middles. Okay. Okay. So I talked about these before. It's all from the shoulder. All this meat is from the shoulder. What's this, Pat? That is the marinated veggies from the salad. Yummy. So you can see the total difference in size here. So this is the same, like the small intestine. So that the hog casings were the small intestine of a pig, and this is the small intestine of a cow. These are thicker. Um, more durable, so I can hang a heavier sausage in it without it busting open. Um, it's non-edible, uh, so whenever the, the meat is cured, I will peel it back before I slice off a piece to eat. And we're making five pounds, so we might go for, I don't know, 15, 20 feet of these guys. Um, and I have, I have cured them like long and whole, but it's kind of crazy. So what we'll probably do is like stuff, tie, stuff, tie if we have time. And then what we'll do after that is tie them. So we want to tie them up with twine. Um, and then I have a beneficial mold culture that we can roll them in. Have you ever seen that white mold that grows on salamis? Mm -hmm. That's what that is. It's a penicillium strain. 
And what it does is it, um, it's nine, okay, so that's only about 10 or 12 feet. It's a beneficial mold that will inhibit some of the nastier molds. And there's not a lot of molds that you can get that will hurt you. They will just cause like off flavors. So if you see like fuzzy black or fuzzy green molds in your cabinet, it usually means your humidity is too high. So you can try to combat that humidity with fans or opening the door a few times a day or whatever, taking the humidifier out if you have one in there, etc. But rolling it in penicillium is just a really great way to make sure you get a good mold on the outside and then you're not going to have those bad molds as you go. Just a note, smoke inhibits almost all molds. So don't roll a salami in penicillium and then smoke it because you'll waste your money on mold culture. So you can see the diameter is much bigger here. And I'm just doing the same thing I did before. I'm just running water through it. And when we stuff this, we will use the bigger, the biggest of the stuffing horns that we have available. And we might have to use the Vivo because I think I lost the big one for the little ohm can stuffer. And I welcome volunteers to stuff this. Just don't mess it up. <laughs> so I just found some holes in this. But I'm not going to do anything. We'll just like, I'll just cut it there and we'll just end one of our salamis right there. That way we don't waste any casings. So this is probably the most standard natural casing used for salamis. It's going to produce a salami that's about that big when it's done. That's about what you see in the store. The other thing that's used for like capicola or kappa is a beef bung. And that is exactly what you think it is. Um, and it's like this really big, amazing six, seven inch diameter veiny beef bung that is usually used for stuffing like big chunks of meat into. So not, I mean, some people will stuff ground product into it, but you can, like a capicola is usually like three inch pieces of pork shoulder that are cured, that curing step, and then they're stuffed, hand stuffed into a beef bung and it's fermented. Um, another thing you can use is bladders. Hog bladders are used a lot for like bigger hams. Um, so that's another option for fermenting. Uh-oh, what happened? Did you get exactly. some silver skin? Oh, man. Did you? Yeah. You should have just said that. Any questions about fermenting? I know it's a lot of information. Do you feel overwhelmed? So, in a general sense, for all these things you've gone through here, it's obvious that, uh, you know, most of us probably just go to the store and buy this stuff, and mm -hmm. it's all magic, what you're talking about, you know. Um, but it looks like you can kind of mix and match some of this stuff, you know. You can do one thing, one process, and then do another process. So, totally. to be safe, in a general sense, you know, in a, in a general sense, just a, a, a one sentence or two, what would you say is the best way, if you're mixing and matching and playing with this stuff, you can, to be safe so you don't end up poisoning yourself? Well, the safest thing you can ever do is cook it. Okay. So um, smoking it, smoking it uh, in a hot, in high heat or a medium heat for a long period of time. It wouldn't really matter your heat. I mean, you wouldn't want to cold smoke it because it won't be cooked. Right. But if you want to cook the product, warm or hot smoke will get you to temperature. Okay. And you want to get it to temperature. So temperature being like for beef and lamb and goat, you can go to like 120, 125. Right. For pork, you can go to 145, 150. For poultry products, you always want to be at 160. Um, if you're fermenting something and you're not sure it's going well and you're nervous about it, but you don't want to waste that money or that time, just take it out and smoke it, mm -hmm. you know? Like there's generally always a way to figure it out. I have been doing this for a while and I don't feel like I've ever like epically failed at anything. You know, I've definitely had projects not go the way I wanted them to, but you just have to be flexible and you have to think on your feet, you know, like, yeah, please feel free to come up here and pick this head. If that is, it's a little bit hot. I can get you some forks if you want. How's it going? No, it's fine. It happens.
Yeah. Just dropping it in the bowl, yep. And the fat too, fat and skin and everything, you know. If you find some skin with hair on it, definitely take that out. The nose is funny, I mean, it's mostly fat. Okay. Yep, there you go. And the fat, you just said Just kind of smush it through your fingers. Pull it's it up like you're teeth. making pulled pork. No teeth. <laughs> Why does it have the name cheese? Um, I guess just because it has like a I've never cheesy had it. consistency. Yeah. We ate it when we were kids all the time. Oh, I've never Have had you tried it? it? No. Oh, okay. So I don't know anything. I, I have no idea what it means. And what it's it just a, like. uh, a gelled meat okay. in a log and you just slice it and put it on a But this is going to be good. That is like perfectly cooked. And Oh, cool. That's so awesome. What's up? Like this kind of stuff, does it go in? No. Okay. I mean, if you don't think you'd want to chew it, then put it in there. Okay, because okay. I came to put it. Okay, I came to put some gristle on that guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, this is basically the cooked, finished product. So whatever you wouldn't want okay. to chew, don't put it in there. <laughs> Um, let's just keep it how it is, just in the interest of getting through it. Okay. So if you want to put the, um, the coarse plate on okay. and run this fat through into, just run it into this bowl if okay. you want. And I can take this out of your way if you're done with it. Yep. Would you mind passing me that scale over there really fast? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Course plate. Ah, didn't you have it? So what I'm doing, if anybody's interested in the salami, what I'm doing right now is I am creating the mold culture that we're going to put on the outside. So I, it's got directions on the back. It's um, for a liter, which is probably enough for us. Um, it says to weigh out three grams of mold culture and then dissolve it in tepid, lukewarm water. And then it's supposedly you're supposed to hold it for 12 hours, but we're just going to hold it until we're ready to roll it and assume that it's going to do fine. And sometimes it won't take. I mean, I've rolled it in, on a chorizo or a pepperoni and then on this salami before and hung them both together and it'll grow on the sweet salami and on the hot salami. And like, I don't really know what happened, but... I've grown it on a pepperoni before, so I don't know. Oops. So I just did four grams. Oops, that's okay. So what if it doesn't grow on there? Is it okay anyway? That'll be all right. I mean, it's just, you're just kind of at a disadvantage if you have a humidity problem. Also, like, it has a bit of a flavor. Like, have you ever had a salami with the white mold on the outside? It's got that nice, sort of like woodsy flavor to it. So that's, that's kind of cool. So you wouldn't have that, and it wouldn't be as pretty, but, yeah. you know. It might be a penicillium strain. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just going to stir it up in there. Yeah, that's all. And then what we'll do is mix this in with it after you've ground it. Okay. Let's put the other plate on, though. Can we put the coarse plate oh, on? Oh, I'll pop that. Um,
Yeah. I think you might want to chop it up with a knife, um, just into, you know, diced pieces. So what we'll do with this when we're done stuffing and tying the salami is we'll put it in a sheet pan and we'll just roll them in it and then hang them up in the cabinet. Simple as that. So I'm going to let it hang out here and just marinate. Sorry, such a pain in the butt. I'm sorry. Oh, you got to know. Oh, good work. Hold that till I put the other one on so I don't put it back on. <laughs> I will just rinse it off. How about that? Is Michelle in the house? Cool. Do you feel like getting up in this mix and cooking some sausages? Sweet. I was thinking you could use this pan. And so, I prioritize the links first, and then if you feel like cooking the bold stuff, you can. Prioritize the links. Okay. Should I wipe this out or is it good? It's fine. Okay. Mmm, the school scissors. <laughs> so sharp and effective. And if you need any liquid, I would just spoon out of there. Red wine. I'll put this back in the fridge because I don't want it to sit here and poach while you have the heat on. All right, so like what, medium? Yeah, medium. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so Joe, you're going to put the dice fat in with that fat, and then we'll put the salt and the nitrate in there. Hey, Pat. There's also three different block cheeses in there and a tub of goat cheese if you want to slice them up. Thank you. I'm going to take a picture of y'all. Look at you go. That's the broth that they mixed up while y'all were running around the building. I'm taking your picture, Joe. Oh no, camera will break. Okay, where's the, where's my, okay. where's my chemicals? It's in a bowl back here. I'll get it for you. That looks delicious, Pat. Pretty good. How are you? Sorry, I'm reaching. The baking process doesn't make for the most like even though. Sandwiches may fall apart. Oh, sorry. So what we're doing now is adding I factored in the nitrate to the kosher salt, so this is a combination of nitrate and kosher salt. We're putting on the fat, mixing it in. Just the fat? Just into the fat, and then we'll mix the fat and the lean together. So the lean got like the wine and the spices oh, yeah, and the yeah. sweeteners, yeah. I'm going to get that Vivo set up for you to stuff. Um, if you want to chop it, I probably won't pull apart, but if you want to chop it, you can. Well, I mean, if, the rule is if you want to chew it, put it in. If you don't want to chew it, don't put it in. Well, if it's, but at the same time, like, think about, like, barbecue that got cooked too hot or not long enough. Like, you don't pull it apart, but you can still chew it. You just might want to chop it a little bit, you know? Oh, thank you. Oh, good. I did, yeah. I'll be there again this year, I think. I hope. 
I love that show. I'm going to the one in Texas this coming weekend. Some what? Yeah, let's mix it all together. What's in Texas? The Mother Earth News is doing a fair there in near near Austin. So I'm going. I'm going for like four days. I'm gonna to try to see some stuff. I've never been there, so. All right. I just bought this. I haven't used it yet. I'm kind of excited. I bought this from my friend Ann, who owns a butcher shop in West Jefferson, up near Boone. She sells them at her shop, but you can probably find it online. It's 200 bucks, but it's nice and hefty, yeah, you know. I saw, I saw, I was about to come up and hold yours now while you were Yeah, it actually worked out better than I thought it would. Usually it's moving around like crazy on me. Yeah, you'll have plenty to do now, right? <laughs> did you make head cheese with your head? No, I, I gave it to a friend of mine who did. Right, nice. She cut the jowls off and made the sausage. That's awesome. Yeah, the jowls are some of the best parts, I think. This hog weighed 24.55. Was it Sal? Wow. Was it castrated? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was planning on killing him at Thanksgiving, but it was so rare. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was supposed to do a couple of, of slaughters around that time, and I was like, we're not going to do this. This is too hot. How's it going? Good. Yeah. 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 This is Isn't that so cool? The stuff we don't want. Yeah, don't want. And this, like, here's a year. Yeah. All right, y'all, if y'all want to stuff that, you can, but if we want to just eat a bulk, we can. It might be easier. Just save some time. Y'all want to stuff the salami? Yeah. Yeah. All right, here. So the way this works is the, the can tips. You can see. Okay. So you'll load it by tipping it backwards and stuffing it in there. What's up, Joe? That ready? That's ready, and I, I think I put the casings over here somewhere. Yep. You guys want a sheet pan to put it on? Are right, you feel good about this? Yeah. So you want to you want to load, load all your load all your casings on first, mm -hmm. and then when we stuff, instead of stuffing one long coil, we'll stuff lengths that are maybe like eight inches long, mm -hmm. and then you'll stop and pinch it, and I guess Russell can cut it or whatever, and then I can stand by or maybe Tia can help tie the ends with butcher twine. All right. What uh what knot? Like you can just overhand. an overhand bubble knot. Yep. So I'm just gonna start cutting, you feel like tying? Sure. But I'm just gonna start cutting you a bunch of little tiny pieces of string. Because every end has to be tied. Like it'll be bubble knotted and also tied. <laughs> sharp that. knife, sharp knife, sharp knife. Sorry about that. So they're gonna stuff the whole thing first in there? They're gonna stuff only like eight inch lengths at a time. Okay. Because when we hang them, I don't want it to be like super duper long, you know? You know what we could do, you guys, is do half of it in, in like little logs, and then the other half you can make a long one if you want. It's just, it's harder to tie the long ones off, because we're going to tie twine around the whole thing, too. It just like takes forever. So when they're doing the 8 inch lengths, are we cutting it in between there, or are we tying it? Yeah. Um, we can cut it. We can cut it. It doesn't matter either way, but it'll be easier for them to work with it if they don't have like a tail. It'll be easier for you guys to work together that way. You know what I mean? So 
just doing the knot. They're gonna tie a knot in the casing and you're just gonna tie a double knot around the, like under the bubble knot. Cause this will be what we tie, what we hang them from, you know. I gotta get this parsley over to the head cheese group. You're welcome to use this knife, but it is very sharp, so be careful. Oops, I'm sorry. Hey guys, do you feel like you're getting that into small enough pieces? Because I have this parsley for you and I can go ahead and dump it in if you want, but I can just leave it with you if you want to. I'm just squishing the fat through my fingers. That's perfect. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We okay, I can, I can, can I use this knife for that or are you using it for veggies? Okay. I'll use this one. They call it what? Strickling strick of fat. Oh, really? You know, Strickling strick of fat. I get it. You know, because you used to, you, you would have like the part, what they call just the fat bank. Yeah, totally. Fat. Yeah. The skin attached to it. No lean. Okay. And then when they had a little lean to it, they would call it strickling strick of fat. Well, people used to take the, the, the fat portion of it and make lard from it. Oh, yeah. Like render it after they cured it, you mean? They would take um, one of those black wash pots. Melt it down. And, 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 and yeah, put it in the yard, and that's when you get the but did they, the But did they cure it first? Or did they no, just, okay, okay, no, they yeah. they would do it fresh, and, you know, they would just you know, have this black wash pot and build a fire around it, cut the meat up in small pieces, <laughs> put it in this pot, let it cook down, and yeah. then would take a, a, a pure spoon, yeah, definitely. I do that in my crock pot. Uh-huh. And people say crackers and make bread and stuff with, with the crackers. <laughs> what? You need a skull? Well, you can take it home. Yeah, I got a friend that collects skulls. Yeah, I collect it myself. But I don't need that. You take it home. I don't need any more stuff. I'm moving tomorrow. Oh, man. I think you want to do this, Alan? I'm going to help the salami stuff for people. Sorry. The other thing I can do, have you do is there's... What's up? I just want to real brown. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and then just flip them. That's great. I might have you slice some ham too yeah, while you're just you waiting for that. I'm stealing one of these. I think I just have a lot going on. All right, so this is tasso ham. Wow. That's yeah, okay. It just needs to be like sliced up, and people are welcome to eat these too. This is basically just lardo, which is good. Um, so if you have a knife, you'll have to take these strings off. Slice them. There's 20 or 25 people, so just make sure there's at least one for everybody. And this is jowl bacon. 
So you can slice it off and then cook it cool. after the sausage is done. So just 25 slices. Dish, yeah. And then this right here, Michelle, I don't know if we can get it thin enough, but this is like a French dry salami that um, it would be great if everybody, this is the only dry cured sausage that I have, so it'd be great if people could try it, but you'll have to peel this off before you slice yeah. it. Okay. I know I don't, I didn't give you a lot of room here, but let me get you my chef knife. How's it going, y'all? Get it, stuff it a little bit thicker than that. So yeah, you want it to be a little more full. What you can do, what you can do right now, since we're going for, it's very timid sausage making. Yes. Well, it always is when you yeah. start. It's okay. okay. Yeah. So the beauty of this is that we can, you know, this will be one yeah. unit, and it'll it'll cure faster. And I might not have given a lot of tail for ton of not, but. We'll, so you can start over there, and you want it to be, you know, I mean, fill it up. Fill it, yeah. Because the more air it has when it's fermenting, the more susceptible you are to getting funny molds on the inside. Okay. You don't want that. So. So if we do get an air bubble through. with this, are you we'll just, popping it like When the we're same? done, we'll go and we'll prick it really good all over the place okay, before we. Cool. All right, so tie that sucker off. Nice. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> All right. Put that in the fridge for me. What is this right here? That's a little piece that got. It's a piece that flew out of there into the pan. Oh, did you taste it? Not yet. Not yet. She threw another piece. Nice. I'm trying it. Is that okay? Probably got a lot of flavors going on in it, but. Wow. This is good. It's good. Very cinnamony. No, it's not very cinnamony. I do want a bigger bite to tell, but it's definitely good. It's definitely got good flavor, good salt. Mm -hmm. It's going to be real good. I don't know where to get some more peppers, but I'll figure that out. Probably. I don't even know where they got those. Yeah. Do you want to make a bunch of patties? <laughs> Do you want to just make a bunch of patties so we can cook them off? Yeah, I will. I just want to taste this one and make sure it's Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. How you doing, Alan? You want me to bring you some loaf pans for this? Are you about ready to put it in loaf pans? Is this the stuff you're happy with right here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna put parsley in it. I thought it was gonna be ground further. You know what I'm saying? I think it looks great. You think this is fine enough? This stuff, this is yeah, cut that a little bit smaller. Cut that one a little bit smaller. I'm gonna put this in. I'm just trying to clear space. Okay. Throw this out. How's it going? It's great. <laughs> Left a little piece. It's great -ish. It's much harder to tie. It is hard, harder to tie than the other casings. So I can help um, if you want to. Or, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Jean. Jean. No, it's great. It's wonderful. I love that you're doing it. So once um, Tia has tied the knots in the ends, we need to get our twine and we need to tie like every two inches around. Okay. Let, let, grab, grab that one for me and I'll show you. <laughs> what happened to that knife? Can I see it real fast? Thank you. So I want it to hang and I want it to cure evenly. So I want to, and sometimes I'll wrap the end. Yay! <laughs> I'm so scared. Mm. 
my knot's coming out. Go the other way. See this way. Oh, you want this to go down. So I'll wrap that around the end, and then I'll go around this end. See what I mean? And then I'll end up on the other side, and then I'll tie to my tail that I got before so that I have one. And you can do two strings going long ways if you want, or you can just do one. And then once we do that, we'll take you can start in the center to make it even to s easier to space them. Okay. But you want to do them about every two inches. Okay. And you can do them semi tight like that so that it's bulging a little bit because, because it is going to shrink as it's yeah. fermenting. Okay. That is a very sharp knife. Be careful. Okay. So just so you guys know, if you're interested, what she's doing after that is she's tying string all the way around the salami. So first she does one that goes long ways. She, we were like wrapping it under your knot and then going down and then wrapping it on the other knot and going back up and tying it. And then we'll do strings every two inches around the diameter. So that way it's like, it's almost like netting a rose so it cooks evenly. It's like netting the salami so that it cures evenly. And you can buy netted bags for this so that you save yourself time, but it's more expensive. You know? When you were doing it like under your sink, how did you change for it? Oh, yeah, uh, like say you took, you took it out and it wasn't ready. Oh, cool. How did you create like more or less? You don't want to burn your taste buds that you want to eat. I didn't necessarily. Um, I was doing it under my cabinet where I dry my dishes. So if I got like, because I don't have a dishwasher. So I like wash them in really hot water and then set them off to dry and they would let off steam. So I had a feeling like I was getting more humidity right there. That's great. So when we're done, what was in here? It was just dry cure. Okay. That looks beautiful. Doesn't it? All right. So what, what we would do if we were like really on top of it is go and trim all these tails right. with scissors, which I think I have some scissors somewhere. If it cuts as well as it did last time, it'll take forever. Yeah. I'll go get another pair, but you can stick them in here when you're done. You want to try this? Yeah, is it good? Is it ridiculous good? Yeah. What? Yeah, maybe a little more acidity, but yeah. it's good. It's sweet. Like cinnamon. It is sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with marinara it would be perfect. Like that's really good. Would be the sweet and the cinnamon and all that. Yeah, for like a sauce. It's tasty though. Good job. I got a little bit of gristle. Yeah, sorry about that. No, that was my fault. I'm the one who trimmed the meat. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, let me grab some scissors really fast. I just went around, but you can tie if you want to if you feel like you have enough strength. I was a little worried that I didn't well, I, I made it twice the length. It has like yeah. a numbing reaction in your mouth. Good idea. But then I want to go back up here. Yeah, I think it would be really good for the acidity. I didn't have any acidity to add. Just get time consuming until you learn how to do this. Yeah, and then it goes a little faster. Now, what if you tie it? To the same string, or can you tie it to one of these other tails up here? Does it matter what you tie it to? Um, oh, right. This is my. This is the string of the. This is the other end of the string. Yeah, tie it to that. Okay. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Can I dump this and pat the patties out on here to fry? That's cure, though. Okay. Oh. It has a little nitrate in it. So I don't know if you want to cook it. No, no, no. I meant dump it and wash the string. Oh, tell you, don't dump it out there. I want to save it. Um, okay. Put it. Let me grab something. Will it fit in here? Oh yeah, it'll definitely fit in here. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
that's what I, I, you know, I where we picked it up, but it was off. Oh, oh so many good pictures. Look at y'all. So is this uh, two here? Is that going to be enough? Uh, yeah, you can do more. The more the merrier, really. Exactly. <laughs> All right, is the head cheese done? You feel good about this? Alan? I'm going to put some vinegar and some salt in it. Where's that recipe at? Can we hold that for a second or try to open it for me? My hands are all greasy. Not that yours aren't. Two tablespoons of that ish, and I'll get you two tablespoons of salt. Yeah, yeah, man, let's wash it. Nice, Tia. That looks great. Is this the stuffing line? Yeah. I love it. The stuffing line. <laughs> yeah, this is the tying line. That's the stuffing line. And this is the grinding line. <laughs> That's the grinding line. Usually by that time, it's like formed around. It's kind of formed itself around the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so, uh-huh. And if you have a vacuum sealer, you might be able to keep them a little bit longer. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Yeah, totally. Unless it, as long as it doesn't look black to you. Oh, Joe, be careful. This is a little funny. Why, 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 what are you talking about? <laughs> Looking good. Smile. <laughs> Cute. I wanted to use kosher salt. I'm trying to reach it. Here you go. Let's put some more pepper in there because I've got pepper ground that we're not going to use after this. Y'all just put everything on there. Put that fat on there too. Okay. Here's some pepper if you want. I mean, you put whatever the hell you want in there, really. There's some stuff right here. Uh, Taste it. You can just take you a bit I put some cayenne in there, but you can put some more. Um, taste it. Taste it. Alan, get a fork. You want me to get you a fork? Yeah, you can eat it. Do you remember what happened to that cayenne pepper? I put it back in the room. Oh, I'll grab it. Uh, well, there's 25-ish people, so I can help you in a second. One second, Pat. I got to get in here. Sorry. That looks really good. Bring your fancy slices. I know. I should have brought it anyway for the meat and stuff. <laughs> Taste. <laughs> Cayenne. Oh, yeah? Too much? We'll also put broth over it when we get in there. Well, just remember that when it gets cold, you won't be able to taste the salt as much. So you want it to taste pretty salty. Okay. More salt? I mean, it tastes salty now. Does it taste really salty? It's too salty, but. I think it needs a little more. Did you put pepper on it? Oh my god, it is good to me. Yeah. I would like to put a little. Put some cayenne? Cayenne. Yeah, put some cayenne in there. How much do you want? No, it doesn't take much of that. A little bit. All right, I'm gonna get you some pans. And then, do you have a ladle? Yeah. 
Do you feel good about ladling that out without getting peppercorns, or do you want me to strain it for you? I can, I can try. Yeah, I can ladle it. And how, so what goes next? You put this in the pan? I'm going to put it in the pan, then you pour that aspic over it. Two-thirds, maybe, or, yeah, halfway. Whatever you think. I think two-thirds. You want me to slice you some gel bacon? Yeah. Okay. How's salami team doing? Team Salami. Team Salami's killing it. Right on. Yeah. This, remember, we got to roll it in mold culture and then we're, before we're done. Yeah, totally. We want to slice those. Obviously, we're going to buck them up into like little pieces. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Super helpful. I'm just going to put these right down. Is that OK? I don't know. Um, uh, when you cut into it, you'll find out. <laughs> that's tasso ham that I made. The tasso ham I was telling you about. And that's the sausage we made at very first in the workshop. This is jowl bacon that I've I made previously. And we're going to have head cheese, and we're going to have pate, and we're going to have salad. Of course. So we will I'm gonna take your picture, Alan. Is that okay? I get a lot of Ashley shots. Nice. Okay, cool. And now just, so just yeah, get it packed in. I heard you smacking it. That's exactly what I want to do. Just make sure it's even, you know? We're working over here. What you doing? Do you need help? I love the like the meaty um, faucet. It's like all pressed in it. Raw meat. It's disgusting. Oh yeah, good call. I think orange zest. Orange zest would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you already won, so I don't think anyone's going to complain about it. That might be good to get rid of that super day there. It's pretty gross. Hey, well, I want you to look at these before I call it quits. Is this what you're cutting it with? Yeah.
Yeah, that's mostly what's used for um, like breakfast links, the little ones, you know? You ever seen like the little tiny breakfast links? Yeah, that's usually sheep intestine. I've never used goat intestine before. We're still waiting on those other two. You got more jowl bacon coming? <laughs> well, I'm going to ferment it. I didn't figure anybody was ready for that. I don't know. If somebody does, like they can take some with them. I wasn't gonna draw for one more. I was gonna draw for a book, and I can do that. Each has its place. You can't really replace it. Well, people be stable. Jaw bacon. You guys want another pan? You waiting to cook that? Yeah. Oh, so I can grab the one off the top of the stock. Go for it. You're having trouble? Okay. Okay. Well, if you can't crank it anymore, you're done. So unscrew the horn, unscrew that thing, okay. and we'll just hand stuff the rest of it. Okay. Why do we tie them? Just to, so that they have an even um, diameter. We want it most even diameter. What's that? With the meat kind of to the bottom. That looks beautiful. Really? It looks like a no, it won't pudgy pedal to the bottom. No, it's just, it's just to give it like a nice even. Cool. Smile. <laughs> all right, on. A salami. So is that all of them? Um, there's this right. one over here and this gargantuan Roman warrior. Yeah, that one's awesome. All right. There's a mold culture somewhere. How that would be. We can figure it out. Let's just see one. Excuse me. You want to flip that over, Greg? Yeah. Awesome. What kind of, what's the story behind this? This gel bacon I made before. Just flip it over. Um, okay. You got it? You need help? Yeah, but what about this? What do you want to do about that? This, okay. All right. I'm hoping I did the right thing. Um, like I can't really put it. Yeah, don't in don't okay. push it in there. And then 
switch me places. I'm gonna switch you, so I'm gonna get on this side of you. All right. Ooh, you wanna turn that heat down, Greg? Hey, Greg, will you turn that heat down? It's burning. Lauren, you don't. <laughs> you hit that bar right there with yeah. one of those. Let me, hold on. What is this? Off my stuffer? Yeah, that's some old culture. We'll need a sheet pan. What can I do? Um, you can wash one of these big bowls for the salad. All right, the mold culture. All right, so what you do with the, these when you're done is just roll them around in here. That's it. And then stick them back in that bin right there. Nice, 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 nice. What is this mess? What's your procedure here for, what's your dishwashing protocol? Um, it's usually soap, soap rinse, rinse, and then... Uh, just get it all out of here. One up. Don't worry about it, Greta. I'll wash dishes after. I want you all to eat. Thank you for doing the wiring thing. No, no, no. I want y'all to eat. We're going to put some salad out. We're going to have some sausage coming out. I'm going to pull out that head cheese. It won't quite be chilled. She's, uh, Michelle's washing one right now, so we can just put it in there. Excuse me. All right. It's just lardo, basically. Somebody ought to eat it. All right, we need plates. Lauren, inside that door to the right, there's an old freezer that's not turned on, and inside of it, there's lots of little plates. Will you bring out about 25? Excuse me. Excuse me. That the one we made? What? One? No, that's the one I made before because it wouldn't have been chilled enough. Chicken livers and duck hearts. I did come down inside. Round one. Awesome. What was in here? Oh, there's the name. Is this your mix? Yeah, that is the spice mix that I use. Okay. Would you want to take it home with you? It doesn't matter. John, do you want, did you want this for later? You, you take it. He wasn't crazy about it, so he wanted to it. Well, I'll just keep it. And that does not have the brown sugar in it. I added the brown sugar separately. Okay. So it should actually keep longer that way. Okay, yeah, totally. Thank you. <coughs> Mm -hmm. 
All right, the only other thing we need is the head cheese. And it's on the left side of the fridge in loaf pans. Okay. It's not going to be totally chilled, but maybe just pull out the biggest pan and we'll just eat it. We'll just spoon it out and eat it. Thanks so much, Pat. You're welcome. Big help, big help. Oh man, that's not your fault. That's okay. It's supposed to cool to room temperature before it goes in the fridge, but you know, we just don't have time. So I'm gonna give you a big old spoon and we'll just eat it. It'll be like soup. It'll be yummy. Huh? Nothing. We need to eat. All right, can I have everybody's attention? It's time to eat. No more helping. So there's plates right here, and what we have, I will, I will explain it. The very first pan is the head cheese that is not finished, but it's, it's warm and it's delicious. It'll be like soup, so put that down. Then this is the sausage, the garlic thyme white wine sausage that we made very first. This is some tasso ham that I cured. It's a little on the dry side just because I, I smoked it over a week and a half ago, but it's still fine to eat. This is the fat that came off the top of the tasso, so it's basically like a lardo preparation, so it's a cured fat, and then, and then it's smoked. Then this is jowl bacon, similar to what we cured earlier that was made previously. This is a French dry sausage made without any starter culture and without any nitrate right here. That's a chicken liver and duck heart pate that I made prior to the workshop. This is the winning sausage makers. Yay. Sausage patties, we have a selection of cheeses. Pat. It was kind enough to make his fabulous bread. It's a sourdough. Do you want to talk about it? Normally I call it uh, farmer's French, but I put a little more white flour in so that the, the flavor wasn't hiding meat. So I call it gentleman farmer's French. Ah. <laughs> and a salad. What's on the salad? Salad is um, all our greens, all our veggies, and all our herbs. We um, buy the oil and vinegar, and, all, and our garlic is in the dressing too. And it's... Um, three different lettuces, spinach, um, top soy, um, red mustard, and at least three wild greens, chickweed, lamb quarters, and wow. rock crest. Nice. Um, wow. That's nice. And then it's got marinated um, red and white turnips and miniature, like alpine daikon, so I guess about that big, and red onion. And, nice. and we have some tomatillo jelly that was made in the summertime. We also have some Dijon mustard just because you can't really eat, you know, head cheese and the like without it. And the one great oversight is we have no pickles, so I'm sorry. I didn't have time to make any. Unleash yourself. Are these all done? All in the also, I wanted to ask if there is anybody here who has a curing chamber at home that would be ready to hang one of these salamis. I'm happy to do a drawing or just give it to you. If not, I'll be happy to ferment it, and then you can email me if you want to taste it. Right? Okay. I'm pretty sure my email's on the handout, but if not, um, I emailed most of you before the workshop, so you can get in touch with me via Living Web Farm. Bon appetit. The book is for sale here and now if you'd like to buy a copy. $25. And I can take a card, or I can take a check, or I can do cash. I mean, it can be above. And if you didn't make a donation to Living Web Farms, please consider doing so. On your way out, you can give it to me or to Lisa or to Pat. Mm -hmm. That's taco ham. It was dry cured in the snow. Thank you. Oh, and the lid, this guy. That's the French dry sausage. It's like a really, really basic salon. And are these in your book? Not everything, but okay. most of it, yeah. Oh, I was going to do a book giveaway. Oh, yeah. get some pork in here. Pork? Yeah, we can, we can get pork. It's Gwen Sanders. Won a book. Gwen Sanders won a book. You want it? Okay. <laughs> Oh, no. Hey, uh, was there a bag?
a bit stronger, I would say. You like it? I love it too. Yay. Take one with you. Take one with you then. Anything else like that? Everybody, I just want to say thank you so much for coming and just commend you because we worked through over 100 pounds of meat today. We made bacon, we made sausage, we made salami, we had a contest. We made Canadian bacon, you all are going home with some stuff. It's gonna be great, we made head cheese. We can give away some of the head cheeses too if you want to. If people wanna take them home and chill them. I'm happy to send you home with pate. I wanna keep one of those chicken ones, but I'm happy to send y'all home with the rest of them. So please come forward later if you wanna take home anything. Thank you. Thank you.